Thank you, Minister. That concludes the statement. I apologise to the one member I was unable to call. Point of order, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President officer. President officer. I just want to apologise to you and the Chamber that I should have uh, made the Chamber aware uh, once again that I am a member, a board member of Moving On Inverclyde the Local Addiction Service. I mean, I was asking the thank you, Mr McMillan. That is duly noted. As I say, I apologise to the one member I was not able to take, but I, what I had feared would come to pass did come to pass. We have got a very busy afternoon ahead, and uh, we had to try to keep as much as possible to time. Uh, I will now move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 5122 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic Articles Scotland Bill. I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 5122 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore, is therefore agreed. We will now move on to the next item of business. Uh, the next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic Articles Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments members should have, the bill as amended at stage two that is SP Bill 10A, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for around five minutes for the first division of the stage three. The period of voting for each division will be up to one minute. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the Marshall list of amendments. And we turn to uh, Group 1, entitled Licensing, Removal of Licensing Scheme. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Katie Clark, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I call Katie Clark to move Amendment 2 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move... Amendment 2 and all the other amendments in this group which have the impact of removing the licensing scheme which would be created by this bill. This licensing scheme would be a Scottish Government Scottish wide centrally run scheme which we understand would have a £20 to £50 fee attached to cover the administration costs. I have put down this amendment because of the real risk that the unintended consequence of these provisions would be to create a black market in fireworks in Scotland. There is little detail provided in the bill as to what the licensing scheme would look like. We do not have a principled objection to a licensing scheme being created, but given the concerns which have been raised by and with the Criminal Justice Committee, do not believe that it is appropriate that this should be dealt with by delegated legislation but should require the government to come forward with primary legislation on a licensing scheme to enable a proper scrutiny process. Yes, I have to Alex Hamilton. I am very grateful to Katie Clark for giving way. I agree with Katie Clark that this licensing scheme should have been better uh, and further thought out. However, I am also gratified to note that others are amending the bill to include reviews at various stages. Does Katie Clark agree with me that this will go some way uh, to ensuring that the bill does what it intended to do? And does she also agree that there is a pressing need for this legislation to deal with repeated instances of antisocial behaviour, particularly uh, in the Muir House area of my constituency? Katie Clark. I agree with the member that we have a very serious problem that needs to be addressed and we will be looking at the amendments um, as we go through the afternoon. Um, it is quite clear um, that we do need to tackle this problem. I think the, the issue that I am bringing to the Chamber is that the licensing scheme is not the method or indeed not the way that will do that. This bill, of course, does not ban the use of fireworks. It allows for professional organisations to have firework displays anywhere in Scotland all year round. And those professional organisations do not have to apply for a licence. So local authorities will not oversee the ability of professional organisations to have a public display. I will be speaking to an amendment later which seeks to give councils the power to ban all fireworks in certain areas, including by professional organisations. 
What this bill, however, does is restrict the ability of individuals to buy or use fireworks in Scotland for much of the year. So, therefore, it would be a criminal offence to buy and use fireworks during those periods, and I'm not suggesting that this should change. So, under the bill, it would only be possible to buy fireworks on 37 days, which would include the fireworks season, bonfire night, New Year, Chinese New Year and Diwali. And it would be possible for individuals to legally use fireworks on 57 days around the same period. It is likely that law-abiding citizens will fall foul of these provisions and use fireworks on the wrong day. This bill states that the, um, the individual needs to buy um, a licence to use fireworks um, or to indeed to buy them. And there is no doubt that if this bill, as drafted, becomes legislation, law-abiding citizens will take steps to acquire a licence and only use fireworks if they have one. Mm -hmm. However, there is a significant problem with antisocial use of fireworks in Scotland, and it is unlikely that those who fall into the category of misusing fireworks will apply for a licence. They are more likely to obtain fireworks on the black market, with a trade developing of fireworks being available from unregulated sources. This is what has happened in a number of other countries where similar schemes have been introduced. In the committee, there was much discussion about people buying fireworks out of the back of white vans. If we look across Europe, in Italy, restrictions were brought in in 2015, but there is no sign that the significant antisocial and dangerous use of fireworks there has been impacted. Indeed, the evidence is of illegal fireworks factories as evidenced by the seizing of large quantities of illegal fireworks and explosives by the authorities. Indeed, in spite of these regulations, it was reported in January 2021 that following New Year, which is their biggest firework event, 79 people were injured, a huge number of birds were left dead, and Skywork, um, Sky News Italia reported on the 1st of January 2022 that a year later, at that new year, in spite of bans being brought in some cities, 124 were reported injured, 31 hospitalised, 14 of whom were seriously injured, with 20 minor, um, minors amongst the victims. In the Republic of Ireland, fireworks have been banned, but this has not addressed the antisocial use of fireworks. We are stockpiling, and the illegal use of fireworks has significant problems. In Northern Ireland, a licensing scheme has been introduced but there is significant evidence of unlawful use of fireworks being imported illegally. As I said, the bill makes it a criminal offence to buy or use fireworks outside specified days. That would stay in place whether there was a licensing scheme or not. So the issue is, what are the benefits of having a licensing scheme against the risks of a black market with people buying from unregulated sources who are less likely to comply with safety and industry standards. Yes, of course, I'd be very Audrey happy. Nicol. Thank you, for giving way. Um, I, I would agree that there was significant discussion on this issue in committee, but I think the member may also be aware uh, of correspondence that's come in from the Royal College of Physicians of Glasgow that sets out that, uh, and I quote, firework licensing would change the purchase from impulse to one of planned decision uh, making with the burden of responsibility on the purchaser to provide proof of age and suitability uh, to purchase fireworks. So would you agree or would the member agree that that is a, a strong uh, case to have a licensing scheme in place? Katie well, Clark. Indeed, I, I agree with the convener um, of the committee, um, as I've already said, that some individuals um, would um, apply for a licence and would not use fireworks um, the rest of the year. That indeed um, is the case. Um, but I think the issue really is whether um, the licensing scheme would affect the culture change that the Cabinet Secretary has spoken about. And I plan to move on to that, hopefully, um, maybe after I've taken this intervention. Uh, before the intervention is taken, I, I, I would I counsel the, the member that probably she should be starting to bring her remarks to a close. Uh, Russell Finlay. Thank you. I wonder if the member will also agree that the Scottish Government have not brought forward any 
analysis and modelling in respect of how many licences are actually likely to be applied for. Katie Clarkin, please wind no, up indeed, on this and, one. and another feature, as the member knows, is that there are very few fireworks convictions being taken through the courts, despite the fact that there are many hundreds and indeed thousands of complaints each year. The two main reasons, as I understand it, that the Scottish Government give um, for a licensing scheme, and, and the Minister will come back on this, obviously, um, is that it's an attempt to shift the culture around fireworks in Scotland, and that anyone who applies for a licence will require to undertake an online, an online training course. And I indeed agree, there's definitely a need to shift the culture around fireworks. We have a significant problem with the antisocial use of fireworks, including fireworks being used as weapons against emergency services and others, um, pets and other animals um, are often distressed, and there are particular problems for specific groups such as those um, with autism. But we need to change the culture. The issue is whether a licensing scheme of this nature will do so. There's no doubt that it will prevent some people who, have, um, who would set off fireworks in their gardens from doing so, which I think is the, the point that Audrey Nicholl was making. But the risks of a growth of a black market are probably more significant. I agree that there's a strong argument for training, and I personally would support robust face-to-face -face training for those buying fireworks into how to handle them. But there's no suggestion that that's being proposed here. Ms. Ms. Clark, could you please bring uh, Mark to a conclusion on this point um, at this point? Thank you. This is an enabling piece of legislation. It will allow the Scottish Government to introduce a licensing scheme by delegated legislation. Any licensing scheme needs proper scrutiny by this par um, Parliament. And for this reason, I ask for support for all of the amendments in this group. We know um, that the creation of these um, restrictions um, is likely um, to lead to the demise of specialist fire shops, um, firework shops who currently provide advice and, um, uh, advice and guidance. And we believe that the creation of this licensing scheme potentially creates more problems than it solves. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, just uh, very briefly, we've got a lot to get through today in its first group. Thank Katie Clark for her amendments. Just from the outset, I'll say we can't support the approach that she's taken uh, to simply remove the licensing scheme altogether. Uh, I think there is some merit to it, but she rightly raises issues about the devil being in the detail and, and the fact that it's not in the face of the bill. That's something the Stage 1 report uh, from the committee raised. I mean, I just want to say from the outset, in the very opening minute of Ms Clark speaking, I heard the Minister shout across the room the word rubbish. Uh, I would like to say I hope that's not the direction of travel for today's debate, and I'll tell you why. Because, if, sorry, if I may, it's a ser these, these are serious issues that we're going to debate. We have a lot of very considered and thoughtful amendments that have been proposed by members right across the board. And it's notable that all members of the committee have worked extremely constructively with the government, with civil servants, and surprisingly, believe it or not, with each other. And I, I hope that we can maintain that level of respect throughout this afternoon's debate as we put forward our own ideas about how we think we can improve the bill. The government's welcome to disagree with those ideas. They're welcome to vote against them when we vote on them. But I would like us to at least go into this debate with that considered approach. Um, the only point I would like to make in addition to that is that I appreciate Mr Cole Hamilton uh, has talked about uh, the need for uh, doing something to address fireworks. At no point has anyone uh, in this chamber, across whatever your views on the approach of this bill, accepted uh, that, that we can just sit back and the status quo will remain. What we do have, though, in front of us this afternoon is a wide range of amendments that seek to improve the bill, that seek to uh, strengthen it in, in many ways. And I would point out that when we try to do this at stage two, Almost every single amendment uh, split the Justice Committee on an equal uh, splitting, and, and most of the amendments fell purely on the, as a result of the casting vote of the convener. And I think that is testament to the fact that there is cross-party uh, support for some of these amendments. And I hope that members who perhaps didn't sit through the Stage 1 evidence session or did not participate in the drafting of the Stage 1 report actually do read and have read the Stage 1 report. It was a very considered and thoughtful one and indeed contained many criticisms, many of which have not been addressed, which we will seek to do uh, over the course of this afternoon. I call Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to join with Jamie Green before we have this Stage 3 underway. The, we have supported the government's attempts to control fireworks. There is a consensus on this. But we must, 
Um, I, I think we must be allowed to scrutinise this stage three without heckling from the minister. Uh, perhaps you want to intervene on me because this we're doing our job because if you ask the public if they want more control over fireworks, of course they will agree. But in their minds, they want to hold the they want to halt the misuse of fireworks. And they might not be thinking of themselves sitting in the back garden in November when they're setting fireworks off. But the bill is quite clear, and this is an important point. The 57 days in which you're permitted to use a firework can stand alone without a licensing scheme. So the offences can stand alone. You don't need a licensing scheme to create a criminal or a, a, a breach of the regulations. The question that Katie Clark puts, and rightly so, is whether a licensing scheme does actually add anything to the type of restrictions that the public want. And it's a legitimate question to ask whether or not, if people do not apply for a license under this bill, that perhaps they'll go somewhere else to get their fireworks. Now, the industry are quite clear, I will in a minute, the industry are quite clear that they are ch challenged the minister on her assertion when she says that a delivery driver would have a legal, ob legal obligation to check for a licence as they do with other age-restricted purchases. But the British Fireworks Association says that is true, but this duty does not extend to the, the, the checking the licence for a firework. Now, if that is what the industry is saying, I think there's a duty on us to examine whether or not there might be unintended consequences of this licensing scheme, and I'm happy to give way on that point. Minister Ash Regan. Well, what I would say to, to Labour, to both the members that have spoken already today, is that the licensing scheme is a core part of the bill. It was developed um, as a result of the recommendations from the review group. And I also think that the members are, are muddling up different schemes in international jurisdictions and comparing a scheme where fireworks are completely banned to the one that we have here um, is introducing a little bit of uh, disingenuousness, I would suggest, to the debate. And there, I would say to the member that there is still a legitimate route for people in Scotland, if this bill is passed, to be able to buy fireworks legitimately. I think it might be reasonable to say that if we had closed down all legitimate routes to buy fireworks, that people might seek to buy them elsewhere. Would the member accept? Colin Bitneal. Accept? Well, there's quite a number of points you made there. I mean, first of all, what we're saying is that you can still control fireworks without a licensing scheme, because the 57 days which the minister has chosen as where fireworks can be permitted, um, would be an offence to let a firework off out with those 57 days. We're also saying that we don't think, and you will presumably acknowledge that the committee did have to fast track the scrutiny of this, which was turned out to be uh, one of the issues. We haven't had time to examine international evidence. So you'd be quite correct to say that Ireland is a different scheme. Well, we didn't get a chance to look at Italy, and that's one of the points that Katie Clark made. We just didn't have enough time um, to look at it. I want to be clear that Scottish Labour supports the government's attempts to control fireworks, and we do accept that the public want action. What we are questioning whether it is the licensing scheme might have unintended consequences. We do not feel that it has properly and adequately been addressed by the government in relation to the black market, which the industry have repeatedly asked you about. I do not feel they have been satisfactory to answers to that, and I think we are entitled to them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would just remind members when they're referring to each other that they should not refer to you because that's referring to me and I have no role in this beyond chairing the proceedings. Um, I call Fulton McGregor, who is joining us remotely. Mr McGregor, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I uh, won't speak for long uh, on, this, on this grouping because I know that we've got um, quite a long day uh, as it is, but I did just want to... Uh, come in and say that, that I won't be supporting the amendments in this grouping in the name of Katie Clark. As the Minister has said in an intervention there, the, the licensing scheme is pretty much the main or at least a primary aspect of this bill. And uh, you know, I, I do actually wonder how close these, um, some of these amendments have come to being breaking amendments, because as members uh, that have sat on the committee with me will know that they, uh, you know, the the licensing scheme is uh, so important in that, in that aspect, although I do respect uh, the fact that Katie Clark 
has continued uh, to bring this forward from stage two. You know, the other, the other thing that members who maybe haven't been involved in this full scrutiny should know is that there's widespread, widespread support from stakeholders uh, on the introduction of a licensing scheme. We took um, a lot of evidence at stage one. We had a lot of panels in front of us, and there is, in the main, um, a lot of support there from stakeholders. Um, we had did hear from the industry that there could be uh, the threat of a black market, but we, we wrote to the Irish government, who gave us a, a very quick response, because we, we were at that stage running out of time when we heard that evidence, and they didn't, they didn't back up those claims with any uh, clear evidence. So I think that is also worth noting. You know, at, at the essence of a licensing scheme and the bill in general is the attempt to change the culture of that we have, the relationship that we have with fireworks. Um, here in Scotland. That's what our constituents want, and that's what the government are trying to attempt. As I said in the, the stage one uh, debate when I spoke, you know, and I think other members said as well, nobody's under any uh, illusion that this is going to happen overnight. But we've got to start the, the, the culture change somewhere, and uh, a licensing scheme is going to be a big part of doing that. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't support these amendments in quite Katie Clark's name. Thanks. Thank you. I now call the Minister to respond. Presiding officer, while this group includes a substantial number of amendments, they seek to achieve one significant effect, and that is to remove the licensing system from the bill. Ms Clark lodged an amendment at stage two to start a debate on whether the licensing system should be removed, and I understand that this group of amendments have been lodged to seek to progress that point. Presiding officer, as I stated during stage two proceedings, I consider amendments to remove the licensing system to be wholly disproportionate step to take. The licensing system is based on extensive consultation and engagement, a point that Mr McGregor has just made, and this includes the 2021 public consultation, which demonstrated significant support amongst respondents for a firework licensing system, with 84 per cent agreeing that it should be introduced. During stage one, the committee heard from a range of stakeholders who were supportive of the range of measures in the bill, and this included the, fire, uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, who stated that the licensing system encourages people to engage in some training in how to use fireworks, as well as making it significantly more challenging to buy fireworks and putting some control around that process. So I understand that members have expressed concerns about the level of detail that's in the bill and what will be set out in future regulations. So following stage one, I shared a licensed user journey with the committee, and this set out the practical steps that a person must follow in order to apply for a license. And all of this detail is already included in the bill. And I hope that this provided members with the reassurance that the fundamental principles and the core functions of the system are included within the bill. And the licensed user journey also pointed to the four areas where regulations are required for implementation of the system. So, as I've previously stated, I believe that the most appropriate approach uh, to take operational details is to set these out in the regulations. And these regulations will be subject to a consultation requirement and the public and stakeholders will have the opportunity to share their views on proposals. And I also brought forward amendments at stage two to accept the DPLRC recommendations and require certain regulations to be subject to the affirmative procedure, which would give the Parliament the opportunity to scrutinise those regulations further. And this relates to the broad regulation making power at section 18, which means that where regulations may go beyond any type of administrative detail, they will be subject to the affirmative procedure. So, presiding officer, to conclude my comments to this group, I consider that this group of amendments and the attempt to remove the licensing system is excessive. This approach will actively work against the results of the consultation and the engagement that has contributed towards the development of the system. And so I would ask Ms Clark not to press these amendments, and if she is minded to do so, then I would ask members not to support them. Thank you. And I call on Katie Clark to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment number two. Ms Clark. Not moved. Not moved. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, could you actually formally withdraw the amendment? Of course, presiding officer, I withdraw the amendments. Thank you. Uh, Katie. 
Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to I'll maybe deal with that in a minute. If I could just deal with Ms Clark's withdrawal of the amendment first. Um, Ms Clark seeks to withdraw amendment number two. Does any member object? No member objects. Amendment number two is therefore withdrawn. Um, I, I missed whatever was going on there, but I would ask. It's going to be a long afternoon, and I would uh, encourage everybody in the chamber to uh, settle into the, the spirit of the stage three, and we can all get through this in a in a reasonable fashion, hopefully. Um, I now move to Group 2, uh, licensing proof of licence. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendment 69. I call Jamie Green to move Amendment 68 and speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Green. Thank you. Uh, never mind the spirit of Stage 3. We'll all need a spirit of some sort by the end of this afternoon, by the looks of it. I know, it's a bad joke, but they get worse. Do hang around. Um, so Group 2 is about uh, proof of having a licence, uh, and I'm pleased that the uh, Labour member has withdrawn uh, group, uh, Amendment 2, and I hope we'll continue that theme with the others in the group, where it will be an even longer evening. But um, Amendments 68 and 69 uh, are quite self-explanatory. They relate to the licence scheme, but more importantly, the interaction between the purchaser and the retailer, uh, specifically the circumstances where a, li a proof of a licence will be needed or uh, required. Amendment 68 ensures that it is the onus on the purchaser of fireworks to provide proof of holding a licence at the point of purchase. Now, be that electronic or paper, the detail of that we are yet to see. People traditionally buy fireworks in two sources, uh, in person through retailers. That then is broken down into two subgroups. There will be specialist retailers who only sell fireworks. 360 odd days of the year, or through most likely uh, other department stores or larger retailers uh, where they will purchase fireworks. But the other place they will buy fireworks is online, and many people do. Now, of course, some of those will be Scottish based retailers who uh, sell online as a sideline, others will be other UK online retailers, but many others will be outside of the UK. What the bill currently states is that individuals, unless they are exempt, uh, to hold a licence uh, uh, must have a licence at the point of purchase, but nowhere does it say they must present it at the point of purchase, which strikes me as quite odd. Amendment 69, closely related to that, will require the seller of the licences to take reasonable steps to view and, where possible, retain a copy of the buyer's licence at the point of purchase. It's not mandatory, but they must take reasonable steps. Um, in, essentially, this isn't an onerous ask of either the purchaser or the seller. But the reason I've put these in is the issue of online sales, because there are two things that this legislation uh, cannot do, and this is why I believe there are holes in the licence. The first is that you cannot force retailers to check for a licence, which is why they must take reasonable steps. I understand that that is not within the competency of the Bill or the Parliament. The second uh, loophole is that you cannot regulate online sales in the way that you, cannot, that you can seek to regulate face-to-face -face sales. So my second amendment is what it's striving to do is to strengthen the need for retailers to check that a purchaser does indeed hold a licence. Because it is, still remains unclear, in my view, at this stage, even at stage three, the whole murky world of online firework sales. And there are some unanswered questions that I hope can be answered as a result of these amendments in today's debate. Will online sailors, uh, sellers of fireworks still sell to consumers in Scotland? That's a question we don't know the answer to. Will they check for licences? Are they legally obliged to check for, license, for licences? Can this parliament, through legislation, force them to check for licences, more so if those businesses are outside of our jurisdiction? And what happens if they don't? Will they be prosecuted by Police Scotland under Section 5 of the Bill, as it is currently drafted? Secondly, what happens if someone drives across the border to, for example, Northern England to purchase fireworks? Will those retailers have to check for a licence? And if they don't, uh, does that mean that an unlicensed person could purchase licences in a retailer across the border? How will that retailer know the purchaser holds a licence if they are neither checking a Scottish central database unless the licence is produced at the point of purchase, which is the point of my First Amendment. 
Even worse, how will they know if someone has been refused or rejected the licence, which is possible in the legislation, or worse still, has, have had a licence but it has been revoked uh, by ministers or otherwise? And the unfortunate truth, presiding officer, is that we don't really know the answer to all these questions. And I suspect that the answer would state that none of the above is covered in the bill. These are unfortunate loopholes that my, I think, uh, relatively simple amendments uh, try to fix in the only way that they can in the competency of the bill. Thank you. I call on the Minister to respond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 68 seeks to require a fireworks licence to be presented specifically at the point of purchase, either online or in person. And this is unworkable, as the Bill does not and cannot regulate behaviour outside of Scotland. So Section 5 of the Bill ensures that suppliers will take reasonable steps to establish that they are not supplying fireworks to an unlicensed person. And this is not confined just to the point of sale, but to every part of the process of supply. So for transactions with retailers out with Scotland, which was the example that the member gave there, it's the delivery company who will be subject to the requirements of Section 5. So for example, if fireworks are purchased from a European website online and the delivery address is in Scotland, the physical handing over or delivery of the goods is part of the supply of fireworks and it is that part of the process where enforcement action in Scotland for online sales can be focused and it's anticipated that this will work in a similar way to delivery of age restricted products where the person delivering the products must satisfy themselves that the recipient is of a permitted age to receive the delivery. So, Presiding Officer, I believe that Amendment 68 is not feasible and I won't be supporting it. Um, Amendment 69 seeks to provide examples of what constitutes reasonable steps to determine if a person has a firework licence by setting out that this includes viewing and retaining a copy of the person's firework licence. So, Presiding Officer, whilst I do sympathise with the intention behind these amendments, um, I don't think it's right to provide such examples. We don't want to cause unintended consequences or narrowing of the scope of this defence. And I believe that we had um, a quite a detailed exchange on that at stage two. And we should leave it to the police, the prosecutors and the courts to determine in each individual case if the evidence supports this defence applying to a particular supplier. And for this reason, I would ask Mr Green not to press his amendments. I uh, call on Jamie Green to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 68. Uh, can I thank the uh, Minister uh, for her response? I mean, it, when drafting these, it was a, a bit of back and forth with the legislation team on how we, we go about this, given the, the technical nature of what we can and can't do within the scope of the Bill. And if the Minister's lawyers are content that this would create problems if passed at stage three, then I accept that. But in the response uh, to uh, my comments, I think actually demonstrates the point that I'm trying to make is that if we cannot force someone to present their license if, at the point of purchase, if we cannot force the retailers to check for a license, then A, none of the questions that have been answered is how do you know someone has a license if they're not required to show it? Secondly, what happens if someone does not have a license or has had a license which has been revoked? And if we cannot legislate from outside of our own jurisdiction, i.e. a Scottish retailer who sells fireworks in a face-to-face -face environment, um, then how on earth is this bill going to have any teeth if, if the majority of fireworks move to an online environment? And it is quite possible that people can still go on the internet, Google fireworks, buy them, and at no point will they be asked to present their licence at the point of purchase by the retailer. Shifting all of this onto courier companies, by the way, to which we took no evidence from at any point in the proceedings, is simply to say that it is the supply, the supplier must check, not the retailer, not the seller, but the person who turns up at your door and knocks it and says, do you have a licence, can I see it? That's not in the bill. Uh, and and we, took, we took no evidence on that. And I'm afraid that diversion from this is the only place we think we can regulate that does create an issue. So again, we're, you know, it's unbelievable that we get to stage three of the bill and there's clearly still holes, massive holes, in what the bill is seeking to achieve versus what it can do uh, through uh, a competency or reality. Uh, and I'm afraid that nothing in the answer that I've heard fills me with confidence that those uh, issues will be addressed. Nonetheless, no member wants to uh, put in an amendment that will, uh, at this stage in proceedings, 
uh, that will create legal problems uh, in the legislation. So um, I will withdraw Amendment 68. Jamie Green seeks to withdraw Amendment number 68. Does any member object? No, no member objects. Amendment number 68 is therefore withdrawn. Uh, I call Amendment 3 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. Amendment number 3 is not moved. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 68. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. Amendment 69 is not moved. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not move. Amendment 4 is not moved. We now turn to Group 3, licensing fees. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendment 71. I draw members' attention uh, that if Amendment 70 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 71 due to a preemption. I call Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 70 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Ms McNeill. Thank you very much. Uh, I move Amendment 70 in my name. Um, so this is in relation to the cost of the licensing fee, uh, uh, an exchange that I had with the Minister at Stage 2. And I would fully acknowledge that the Minister is in the same position as I am, which is that we do not want to make a fee so prohibitive that people will not apply for it. Um, I will say this before the Minister does, um, because it is always usually the case. Um, the wording is not perfect in this amendment. Um, I will just say that up front. That what, I had reflected on what the Minister said at stage two, um, and I did read the, um, I read the proposal again, but what my concern was is that the cost of running the scheme will also include monitoring the existing licence holders and legal enforcement of the scheme. That is what it says in, in the note. However, perhaps you could clarify that. I thought, well, if the scheme is going to cover all these things, it could potentially be expensive. Um, and I think the Minister knows where I am coming from in all of this, is that I have the same concern about the licensing scheme. If it is too costly, then it will prohibit people from applying for the licence, and they will not be able to enjoy fireworks, which is what they are entitled to do um, on the 57 days of the year. Um, so I really just wanted to uh, highlight that point because we did not debate that at stage two, because if legal enforcement is going to be included in the cost, then I thought well, that would be a matter for uh, the legal enforcement authorities. It should not be covered by trying to uh, raise the cost of the scheme, and I would be very grateful if the Minister could respond to that point. Thank you. Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment 71 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am um, here today with an exciting selection box of amendments, and I hope there are no damp squibs and certainly no rubbish. Um, <laughs> now, uh, I heard what uh, Polly McNeill had to say about the cost of licences with her amendment number 70. Uh, the first amendment in my name is number 71, which is in the same group in which I move in my name, and it is similar. Uh, in that it is about the licence fees, but it does not go quite as far, which is what Pauline McNeill wants to see, is seeking to scrap the fees altogether. Now, if there is going to be a licence, we recognise the need for a fee. Of course, the scheme will not pay for itself, but the public should not be unfairly penalised. My amendment is about protecting consumers and responsible users of fireworks. The omission of an actual cost in the bill has been explained by the Minister at Stage 2. The government say licences are likely to cost between £20 and £50, pounds, and the government are asking us to pass the bill and then trust them on this detail. But even £20 to £50, pounds, I would suggest, is a broad spectrum. How many people willing and able to spend £20 pounds on a licence would then pay £50? Pounds? If you want to buy a £30 typical box of family fireworks, then a £50 pound licence does seem too much, and every incremental increase within the suggested price scale would surely result in fewer people applying for a licence, although the Scottish Government appear to have done no modelling on this whatsoever. Now, some might suspect that this may be the real intent, make licences unaffordable and unappealing, resulting in fewer fireworks. But the Bill's omission of a licence price and any explicit commitment to maintain their affordab affordability has risks. Like so much else in this rush legislation, there is a real danger that a prohibitive fee 
would deter legitimate users and drive them towards a black market. Again, where is the modelling on that? Which is why the Bill, through this amendment, needs to include a commitment to keep the price sensible, affordable and accessible. Now, the Government's stated intent is for licences to encourage safe use of fireworks, with online training being central to that. So I hope the Minister will give consideration to this amendment, and if she is not uh, minded to support Pauline McNeill's proposal to scrap licence fees altogether. Uh, and this would go some way to ensuring that cost does not become a barrier to those seeking responsible enjoyment of fireworks. Thank you. I call the Minister. Deputy Presiding Officer, sorry, Presiding Officer, there has um, understandably been much debate about the licence fee during stage one and two. So turning firstly to Ms McNeill's amendment, this seeks to amend the bill to remove the requirement that Scottish ministers must have regard to reasonable running costs of the licensing system when setting a fee and that only a nominal fee could be charged or that the fee could be remitted entirely. And I know that Ms McNeill has raised concerns about system running costs at stage two and how this could impact the licence fee level that is set. So whilst cost recovery will be a key determinant of the fee level in line with the standard approach for all such fees, I believe that a proportionate fee should generally be chargeable in order to ensure that applications are made with due consideration of the responsibilities involved in holding a fireworks licence. And I will just come on to addressing Ms McNeill's particular question that she asked me during her, her contribution. And she asked me, I think, about uh, legal enforcement or legal administration. I think that was the term she used. So it's not the intention, I can confirm that, it's not the intention that the cost will, will cover elements of enforcement. It's for administration purposes only. I'll give away. Jamie Green. Um, if over the course of future years after the licence scheme is in place, um, it becomes apparent that um, we know that it is the cost of the licence fee which is putting off people from applying for a licence. Would the government see that as a success, i.e. fewer people are seeking to buy fireworks, or would they see that as a failure of the licence scheme and then thereafter remove the fee or reduce it to a nominal amount, which would encourage more people to come for a licence, which, would, which was the most likely scenario the government would take? Minister. I think the member raises a, a legitimate point. We will keep the fee under review uh, and the modelling that we have done, which the member no doubt will have seen, is that we are modelling um, a reduction in the number of fireworks sales. So we, ha we have modelled that, but we will keep it under review. And if um, what the member says, you know, there's evidence to suggest that, we will look at the, the level that the fee is set at. So to reiterate the point that I made previously, I remain committed to ensuring that the licence fee is proportionate uh, and that it's fair and that it, it will be set following a wide ranging consultation and at a rate which ensures that while robust checks and balances are in place, the fee isn't a restrictive barrier to the safe and lawful use of fireworks. Um, now moving on to Mr Finlay's amendment, um, I don't consider this amendment to be necessary. The bill already requires the fee to be set with regard to the reasonable costs of the licensing system. And so any impact of inflation on those costs will, of course, form part of the fee level which is determined. And uh, consultation on the fee, which will be required before any regulations are made, will also ensure that the fee amount is reasonable and it will allow other cost pressures on individuals to be reflected. Um, I understand the requirement to obtain a licence and pay a fee will in incur additional costs to people who wish to buy and use fireworks. And again, I want to reiterate my point in relation to the amendment that I remain committed to ensuring that the licence fee is proportionate and fair. Ensuring the safe and responsible use of fireworks is imperative to achieving the policy aims of the licensing system. And therefore, I believe that a balance has been struck through the illustrative modelling in the financial memorandum between introducing a licence fee on one hand while um, avoiding overly restrictive barriers to lawfully purchasing and using fireworks on the other. Pauline McNeill to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 70. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the fact we've had another opportunity to have this exchange. I just want to reassure the Chamber I wasn't trying to regurgitate a debate we already had. It was that particular point about legal enforcement. Um, and I'm, I'm really content that the Minister said that the, the cost of running the scheme would not include legal enforcement. 
Um, I also acknowledge that the Minister has said from the beginning that these costs need to be proportionate. We can take a view of what proportionate is, but I think we know that if it is set too high, because in the consultation it was between £20 and £50, pounds, £50 pounds being the higher end, I think in a cost of living crisis, clearly I think we could agree that we would not want to see the fee at that end. I certainly, certainly would not. Um, I have also supported what Russell Findlay has been trying to do from the beginning, which is trying to uh, ensure that whatever the fee is, that it is kept close. Well, I suppose the rate of inflation is not a good guide at the moment, given that it is at 9.1 per cent. But I think we are all on the same page, which is there is no point, whatever your view of a licensing scheme is, is creating something which would prevent people from applying for it if it is too expensive. And on that basis, presiding officer, I am content to ask approval to withdraw Amendment 70 in my name. Thank you. Uh, Polly McNeill se seeks to withdraw Amendment 70. Does any member object? No me I call Amendment 71 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 70. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, not move. Thank you. We move, therefore, to Group 4, Licensing, Procedure for Regulations. And I call Amendment 5 in the name of Katie Clark, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Katie Clark, to move Amendment 5 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. These are two sets of amendments in the group which relate to parliamentary scrutiny. Both would enhance the parliamentary scrutiny, which would be required for any secondary legislation, in particular the licensing scheme. Amendment 5 would change the process so that the regulation-making powers in Part 2 of the Bill that are currently subject to a negative procedure would instead be subject to an affirmative procedure. Amendment 34 goes further and sets out that, lay, that um, the Government would have to lay draft regulations that would be brought before the Scottish Parliament via a pre-laying procedure. This would require the Government to lay a draft of the regulations before Parliament and for the Scottish Government to be required before finalising the regulations to seek the views of the Criminal Justice Committee on the terms and for the committee to have the opportunity for a meaningful role to undertake effective scrutiny of those regulations should they wish to do so. As has been said before, there were significant concerns raised about the bill and the licensing scheme by the committee. The reason for these amendments is simply to enhance the parliamentary scrutiny that would be required, given the complexities of the licensing scheme, which I have already outlined, and the potential risks um, given that the way that these schemes have operated in other countries, and in particular Northern Ireland and Italy, where there are similar schemes. It is imperative that there are ample opportunities, not just to consult stakeholders, but also to ensure there is sufficient debate and scrutiny by members of this Parliament. At stage two, the Minister suggested that the affirmative procedure would not be a good use of parliamentary time. I disagree with this. These are issues which require proper scrutiny so that the legislation, and in particular the licensing scheme, functions well, particularly given the risks of a black market which need to be addressed, which have been raised with the committee, but also have been a feature in other countries. As I said, Amendment 34 goes further than the other amendments with a super affirmative procedure which requires um, the committee's involvement. This legislation um, is complex, although there is a lack of detail in relation to the licensing scheme itself. It could have been much more simple, and for that reason, I believe it is appropriate um, that there is effective scrutiny should there be further regulations brought forward. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. Uh, just to let uh, Ms Clark know, if it is helpful, especially if she is considering which amendments to move or not move, uh, um, uh, that we would support all the amendments in this group other than 33. 33 removes section 19, which I think presents uh, a, a, an issue around the licence scheme. I suspect it may be a consequential of other endeavours to remove the licence scheme altogether. However, the other amendments in this group do make a, an important point by, in some of them, changing the negative to the affirmative procedure, uh, thus uh, thereby increasing scrutiny of future regulations. We know that because so much of the devil of the detail of, of what this bill will create will be uh, brought through regulations. I always would support amendments where, where they arise to improve scrutiny by, uh, by either a committee or the chamber itself, especially Amendment 34, which, as the member rightly points out, 
um, is around the, uh, it ensures that Parliament itself must be consulted about regulations. And I think it's only right, given the lack of detail of much of uh, the regulations that, that will form how the bill is delivered, that, that the Parliament itself, um, that there is increased accountability, transparency, and, and just some good process that's been sorely lacking as we've uh, gone through this truncated uh, uh, scrutiny of the bill uh, at this stage, and I hope that we, we aren't put in that position again as we, we look at the, the detail of the bill in future. So, for that reason, we'll support all but 33 in this group. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, officer. So, I understand that the amendments in this group seek to enhance uh, scrutiny and consultation around the licensing system, but I believe that my openness to increased scrutiny has already been demonstrated by accepting the DPLRC recommendations on affirmative regulations and by including from the outset a consultation requirement at section 19 of the bill. This requirement ensures that there is an opportunity to gather views on proposals for what may be included in these regulations, for example, in relation to the licence fee that we were discussing earlier. So amendments 5, 7, 11, 18 and 20 seek to make the regulation making powers in part two that are currently subject to negative procedure, um, instead subject to affirmative procedure. And I don't consider uh, that the affirmative procedure is either suitable or proportionate for these type of regulations, which will be used to set out operational and administrative details for the licensing system. Um, it's not intended that these powers will be used on a frequent basis, but it is necessary that when they are used, they can be used in a timely manner in order for the licence system to continue to operate efficiently and at an optimum level. So, in my view, requiring affirmative procedures for operational and administrative changes would not be appropriate. Amendment 32 seeks to extend the consultation requirement to regulations made under Section 3 of the Bill. And this section sets out the categories of fireworks that are covered by Part 2 of the Bill, which relates to the licensing system. And the regulation-making power at Section 3.2 has been included to future-proof the licensing system and it enables any changes to the categorisation of fireworks or the addition of new classifications of types of fireworks in the future to be taken into account. So it's important that this power can be used in a, a timely manner so that the licensing system can continue to operate effectively. So this is a technical regulation-making power, and it's intended to be used only if required to take account of legislative change elsewhere, industry or industry developments. And if it is used, relevant stakeholders, such as the firework industry experts or trading standards, will be consulted um, in line with good practice for all regulations. And it's not considered necessary to include it within the duty to consult in section 19. Additionally, while not... I will. Jamie Green. If that power is used, is it the case, therefore, that that would only come to uh, a committee of the Parliament under the negative procedure, in which case the only option available to members would be simply to, for a motion to annul? That's not real scrutiny, though, is it? Minister. But, I, but as I've set out to the members, I've moved on a number of areas where um, I thought it was proportionate for the regulations to be negative. I've moved them to affirmative where they can, they're um, considering substantive details. Um, as I've set out, these are technical, they're administrative. So I think it really is appropriate, as is, um, we've done in many other different types of legislation in this parliament while I've been here, to, to put these into being negative procedure. But the member is quite right. The committee still um, has the power to, um, you know, to knock the, those um, amendments back should they seek to do that, so those regulations, sorry. So while not subject to the consultation requirements, these regulations are subject to affirmative procedure, meaning that they will um, have enhanced parliamentary scrutiny of regulations laid using this power. So Amendment 33 seeks to remove Section 19 from the Bill completely. Uh, it's related to the group of amendments already debated, which aim to remove the licensing system from the Bill. Uh, that is a core policy of the Bill, and this provision for consultation on regulations is essential, in my view, to ensure that the detail of the licensing system will operate well in practice, and members will therefore understand that I can't support that amendment. Amendment 34 seeks to include a new section, setting out a requirement on Scottish ministers before laying regulations in relation to Part 2 of the Bill and the licensing system. However, the matters covered in the regulations under this part of the Bill 
um, are simply not of the nature to require this kind of super affirmative, if you like, procedure, uh, which this amendment would apply. Uh, they are, in most cases, powers to set out matters of operational detail or administrative procedure. And while it is always open to the Parliament to seek additional scrutiny in this manner, I believe this kind of super affirmative power is really best suited to matters of significant importance, complexity or difficulty. So hopefully for the reasons that I have outlined, uh, members will understand why, why I cannot uh, accept these amendments. Thank you. Katie Clark to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 5. Thank you. I am grateful um, to the um, Minister for her comments. Um, it would be my intention to move um, Amendment 5 um, to the vote and Amendment 34 and to withdraw Amendment 33. Um, I have outlined earlier um, the differences between the amendment and the nature of Amendment 5 which would change the process to an affirmative procedure and Amendment 34, which lays out a more detailed procedure that would involve the committee having time to look at the matter in detail. Um, so I would wish to push those two amendments to the vote. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, and as this is the first division of this stage, I suspend for around five minutes to allow members to access the digital voting system.
We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 5. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of Point oh. of order, Foisal Chowdhury. Uh, I was struggling to log in. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Chowdhury. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Point of order, I would have voted yes. I also struggled to log on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 5 in the name of Katie Clark is yes 46, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 6 in the name of Katie Clark already debated with amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. We move on to Group 5, Licensing, Disclosure of Offences. And I call Amendment 8 in the name of Russell Finlay, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Russell Finlay to move Amendment 8 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Group 5 uh, comprises eight amendments in my name. And I want to begin by thanking the Minister for responding positively to my Stage 2 suggestion, which led to a constructive meeting with her and her officials. Now, this meeting resulted in amendments 8, 9 and 48 in my name. At Stage 2, it struck me as common sense that anyone with convictions for fire-raising should be required to disclose these while seeking a firework licence. I am glad the Scottish Government has agreed with me, and I welcome their support of these amendments, numbers 8 and 9. Amendment 48 is a consequential of them, which updates the definition of relevant offences for the purpose of a report on the operation of the Act, as required in section 44A. However, I believe these welcome amendments do not quite go far enough, and that the Bill still contains significant gaps relating to what types of conviction 
a licensed applicant would need to disclose. I will provide a very brief explanation of each amendment. Number 72 relates to convictions for terrorism. Surely all members can agree that a convicted terrorist should have to declare such convictions while seeking a licence to legally purchase explosive material. Um, it is no stretch to suggest the contents of fireworks could be misused by those with ill intent, and I would therefore encourage members to vote for this amendment. I will now turn to Amendment 73. This would require anyone convicted of crimes of fraud to disclose these convictions while applying for a licence. Now, during the Criminal Justice Committee visit to Blackburn, we heard about the so-called white van man who sells fireworks to people, often children. He is the type of person who is fundamentally dishonest and would have no regard for this bill, whatever it says. And that, I would argue, is the type of person who is likely to acquire and then exploit a licence for gain. It therefore seems proper that someone with convictions for dishonesty should have to declare them. Amendment 74 includes the need to disclose convictions for antisocial behaviour. Again, I do not see how this could be reasonably disagreed with. Right now, apart from today's inclusion of fire raising, both reckless and uh, willful, the only disclosable convictions relate to firework misuse. But this is too narrow. What about those who caused torment and antisocial behaviour? on our streets. Uh, amendment 75 would require those with convictions for football-related offences, including violence and disorder, to disclose them. In recent years, we have seen an increasing prevalence of flares and pyrotechnics at Scottish football grounds and other events like music festivals. Police Scotland say these pyrotechnics can be highly dangerous and reach temperatures of up to 1,200 degrees. Two years ago, the minister herself said there is no question about the potential serious harm they can cause, and this is completely unacceptable. And I agree with the Minister, and I hope that she will agree that those with a record of causing trouble at football would need to declare that. Now, in terms of these amendments, uh, 72, 73, 74, 75, it is worth stating that it is, it, this is simply about the need to disclose. It does not block those with these convictions from either seeking a licence nor does it mean they will be refused one. It is important to emphasise these points. Now, th these four amendments, 72, 73, 74, 75, sensibly allow those issuing licences to make an informed decision, which is clearly in the interests of public safety. safety. Now, finally, uh, Amendment 76 seeks to ensure that licensed applicants undergo a disclosure check. Again, this seems to be common sense. While the other amendments in the group put the onus on the applicant, they are premised on all applicants being truthful, which strikes me as being overly optimistic. It may be that some applicants are genuinely unsure about what they need to disclose. It may be that others will just not come clean. And by requiring ministers to ensure a standard disclosure check is completed, this would verify what was disclosed. And those making the decision can be confident that it is being reached with, uh, with sight of the best available information, and that, uh, Presiding Officer, is in everyone's best interests. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. Um, I just want to reiterate two simple points. Uh, the first is that what my colleague is trying to do is ensure that these offences, and I think they are very self-explanatory, uh, terrorism and social behaviour uh, and other types of fire-raising offences are disclosed. It will not and does not automatically refuse the issuing of a licence. That is the first point. Um, but the second point is in the context of what then happens. Um, and a point that we raised and indeed tried to amend at stage two was around the technical capabilities of whatever the licence scheme looks like. We, we do know that it will be a nationally administered scheme, not run by local authorities. And it is worth clarifying that confusion because I, th I don't think it has been clear throughout the process. But whoever administers the scheme, be it someone in the central government, whichever agency or body, we're not sure yet the government will come forward with those proposals. But the onus is on them to check that the information that's been provided is true. Again, I had similar, similarly but different worded amendments uh, at stage two on this. It puts the onus back on the administrator of the licence. Those who issue the licence says that the duty is on them to check that the information 
that has been provided around disclosure is truthful. Now, there are a number of mechanisms available to do that. Uh, my colleague is suggesting some through his own amendments. But I would ask ministers to, not just the ones that the ministers have agreed to work with, uh, with us on in terms of additional offences, but actually the overall premise of how uh, those offences are, are dealt with when issuing licences. And I would ask the ministers, if, if this is not the way to do it, then I would like to hear how the licensed administrators, administrators will check the information that is provided by those who provide the information, because as my colleague said, unfortunately not everyone will be truthful or indeed knowledgeable about which offences should be disclosed, and the onus therefore lies on those who give out the licences to ensure that, that information is accurate in the interest of public safety. Thank you. I call the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So I welcome uh, Amendments 8, 9 and 48 from Mr Finlay, which have been developed following our very constructive discussion since Stage 2 proceedings. Uh, I was not minded to include a requirement to disclose a broad range of offences during a licence application. However, I recognise that there is value in offences where the misuse of fire has been a factor being considered during a licence application. And I understand that members have previously indica indicated a preference for the disclosure requirement to be much broader and to include all serious offences. However, I believe there is a fine balance to be achieved. I don't want to dissuade people from applying for a licence by requiring them to disclose a broad range of um, irrelevant offences. I want people to apply for a licence. I want them to undertake the necessary training course and to be able then to use fireworks uh, and how to use them safely and also lawfully. So the bill currently requires offences involving the misuse of fireworks and pyrotechnics to be disclosed. And should members vote in favour of Mr Finlay's amendments 8 and 9 today, that will extend to an, uh, offences involving the misuse of fire. And I believe that this is proportionate. And I'll ensure that all relevant offences can be taken into consideration when the decision is taken to grant or to refuse a licence application. And just to pick up on Mr Green's points there, um, the Scottish Government will be administering and there will be an enhanced verification process developed. Thank you, Russell Finlay, to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 8. Um, I will press Amendment 8, yes. Thank you. You may wind up, Mr Finlay. <laughs> so I'm new to this. Uh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'll uh, go back to uh, moving Amendment 8. And to, to wind up, um, the Minister is uh, right in what she says, that we don't want to deter applicants due to um, a high bar of, of disclosure. But I don't think it is a high bar. I think it's a perfectly reasonable one. Um, the phrase irrelevant offences was used in the response, and, I, and I, I struggle to see how terrorism, especially, but not least the other ones, could be described as being irrelevant for the purpose of acquiring a firework licence. Um, and I, I, I didn't really hear anything in respect of Amendment 76 about the requirement for a disclosure check. So, therefore, move Amendment 8. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 72 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 8. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Uh, move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. Point of order, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would have voted no. I couldn't connect to the digital platform. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 72 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 43. No 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 73 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 8. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 74 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 8. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 75 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 8. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 8. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 10 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Thank you. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 8. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my uh, device would not connect to the parliamentary system, and therefore I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 76 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 42, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 11 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call amendment 12 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. We move, therefore, to Group 6, Licensing, Appeals and Conditions. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jamie Green to move Amendment 13 and speak to all amendments in the group. 
Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Group six, we're halfway there. Um, I mean, first of all, I find it quite bizarre that we've just voted down an amendment that states if you have a terrorism related offence, you don't have to disclose it when applying for a fireworks licence. I mean, what on earth? So that brings me to the next group, which is what happens if you are refused a licence? Who knows if a terrorist will apply for a pyrotechnic device and misuse it? I really hope that is not the case and never happens. But if someone is refused a licence, there may be valid reasons for it. If the scale of the system is overwhelmed, there may be other reasons why a, a licence has been uh, refused. In any case, though, there should remain the option, and I think it's only fair, that there's an appeals process. I had an amendment at stage two around this, uh, what must happen in that scenario, uh, the scenarios in which some of we presented, I think, helpful information on what an appeal might look like and how to go about it. Um, I can't recall if we moved it or, or, or pushed it to a vote, but in any case, the minister responded, thankfully, quite uh, positively to the concept. I agreed uh, to discuss that further with the minister um, and would like to thank her for the constructive manner in which we went about that. We have come up with these subsequent amendments instead, amendments 13, 16, 22 and 25. Um, I, I understand that it had always been the uh, government's plan uh, that information about the ability to appeal a decision on a licence would be available through the various processes, whether it was through the application, the licence itself or through the revocation process. Um, and I, but I appreciate that the Minister acknowledged that there is merit in including a duty on Ministers to provide that information about the appeals process on the face of the Bill, as my amendments seek to do. And I think in the interest of clarity and transparency about the, what the appeals process might look like, we would ask members to support those amendments uh, and thank the Government for them. Um, I am also supportive of other amendments in this group, namely that uh, Amendment 17, uh, uh, Fulton uh, McGregor's amendment. Um, and other tidy up amendments as well. My colleague uh, Russell Finlay has amendment 77 in this group. I will let him speak to that in any further comments I'll reserve uh, to my summing up. But effectively, I would ask members to support all amendments in this group. Thank you. Fulton McGregor to speak to amendment 15 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm pleased to bring these amendments, which are technical in nature, but I believe important in providing clarity about the types of condition that can be attached to a fireworks licence. I would like to thank the Minister for engaging with me in advance of Stage 3 on these amendments. I have greatly appreciated it. In terms of the amendment, Section 10 of the Bill already makes reference to additional, additional licence conditions and optional licence conditions, which can be specified in regulations which the Scottish Ministers may attach to a fireworks licence. My amendments expand upon the description of the types of licence condition and make it very clear that if additional licence conditions are set out in regulations, these will be mandatory for all licences. In contrast, if optional licence conditions are set out in regulations, these may or may not be attached to individual licences. It is a decision to attach an optional condition to a licence that a person will be able to appeal under Section 14 of the Bill. Additional mandatory conditions, as I have said, must apply to all licences and will therefore not be appealable. Officer, these are technical amendments which do not change either the powers of Scottish Ministers to prescribe and apply licence conditions, nor the appeal rights of individuals from the position which has always been intended in the Bill. And I do therefore hope that, minister, that members will support the amendments I have launched today. In relation to other mem eh, amendments in the group, eh, I do support those that have been put forward and already talked to from Jamie Green. I think that they also eh, make sense and hope that the Parliament will um, also agree to them. Um, I won't speak too much to Russell Finlay's because I know he'll be speaking after me. But um, at this point, I do not support his amendment. Uh, I, I, I think that it, it's perhaps um, too excessive. But I will I will wait to obviously hear what he says uh, following myself. Thank you. Thank you. I call Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment Seventy Seven and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Um, now, my colleague uh, Jamie Green's amendments deal mostly with uh, licensing and appeals around refusal of licensing. I mean, as the bill stands, a license will last for a period of five years. At stage two, I argued that this was excessive for several reasons and suggested that three years might be a more practical and sensible 
uh, time limit. However, I did not move that amendment at that point. Uh, and this amendment seeks to ensure that the Scottish Government applies some proper scrutiny and analysis of the licence period. It is all very well the Minister telling us that five years is fine to trust them, but the five-year duration seems to have been based on pretty much informed guesswork. And I would hope that members would agree that including the need to review the length of licensing will be beneficial and should be welcomed by the Government who want their legislation to work and to win public confidence. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Minister. Presiding officer, if I can just uh, return to a comment that was made by Mr Green um, regarding the terrorism uh, that he mentioned in his contribution earlier. It's just to say that causing an explosion likely to endanger life, which is an offence under the um, apologies, Explosive Substances Act of 1883, can be aggravated as having a terrorist-related connection by the Counter-Terrorism and Sentencing Act of 2021. So just to uh, reassure the member that that is required to be disclosed um, by Section 7 of the Bill. So moving on. Yes? So Finlay. Uh, the Minister identifies one area where terrorism would be a consideration, but does she agree that the omission of six specific terrorism acts uh, is a big miss and should be included? Minister. I think what we have to do is make sure that it is proportionate. We do not want to put people off applying for a licence. And if the terrorism acts that we are talking about here have um, committed an offence involving fireworks, then that will be required to be disclosed. So I think that strikes the appropriate balance, presiding officer. So I would like to start uh, by addressing the amendments that are lodged by Mr Green and thank him for his engagement on these amendments in advance of the proceedings today. And I believe that these discussions have led to revised amendments which capture uh, the intent of Mr Green's original amendments at stage two, and so I am pleased to be able to support these amendments today. And as I have previously outlined, it had always been intended that as part of implementation, uh, processes would be put in place to ensure that people have access to information regarding appeals when they need it. However, as I set out uh, during stage two, I do see merit in placing a duty on Scottish ministers to share that information with licensed applicants and holders at key points when a decision is made. I am happy to support amendments 13, 16, 22 and 25 and encourage other members to do so as well. And then turning to Mr McGregor's amendments regarding the difference between additional mandatory conditions which must apply to all licences and optional conditions which Scottish ministers will have the discretion to attach to individual licences. And I believe that those amendments provide clarity. They put beyond doubt what has always been intended to be in the Bill. So as Mr McGregor outlined, the amendments do not change uh, the powers of Scottish ministers to prescribe and apply licence conditions, nor the appeal rights of individuals from the position which has always been intended in the Bill. And I would like to thank Mr McGregor for his engagement on these amendments before lodging them. And I'm pleased to be able to support 15, 17 and 26. Lastly, turning to Mr Finlay's amendments in this group, which seek to require a review of the licence term one year after the regulations that set out the term are made and then each year thereafter. So I do consider this to be excessive and particularly if a licence term longer than one year is set following consultation, I'm not clear that such a review would provide meaningful results. When the licence term will be consulted on and set out in regulations, and as I've outlined uh, before, our working assumption is currently that the licence term will be five years. Um, Ms Stevenson's uh, stage two amendment that the member will remember requires a report on the effectiveness of the Act within five years of royal assent. And it is at this point when the package of measures in the Bill have had that opportunity to um, bed in following implementation. And I consider a constructive review of the licensing system as a whole can take place at that point. However, should any issues or concerns about the licence term arise before this, Scottish ministers will be able to progress a change through consultation and further regulations if it is necessary. So I can't support Mr Finlay's, a member, um, Mr. Finlay's amendments and I would ask other members not to support them. So, uh, presiding officer, to summarise, um, I support all the amendments in the group with the exception of amendment number 77. Thank you. And I ask Jamie Green to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment 13. 
Uh, thank you. Can I thank uh, all members for the contribution, uh, including the Minister, um, uh, and for supporting uh, my amendments in this group. However, on Amendment 77, on the review of the licence period, um, it, what the amendment specifically does not do is state the duration of the licence. There was quite a bit of discussion about this at stage two, uh, anything between one year and five years and anything in, in the middle. And I appreciate there would be a range of views and also appreciate that the government will come forward with that proposal through regulations. But what we are asking for is that it is reviewed. Now, if one year sounds, or this sounds as an annual process sounds overly onerous, the government could easily have brought forward a different suggestion for that. Indeed, there is a process by which the government can amend amendments, which were suggested at stage three. The problem is, however, is that the deadline for submitting and publishing amendments was so tight, they probably didn't have time to do so. And that, I think, is symptomatic of the rushed nature of the bill at stage three. So what I would ask is that... Yes, happily. Thank you. Now, does the member agree that, uh, given we have absolutely no idea of how many license or licenses are likely to be applied for, that that makes the need to conduct proper analysis even more pressing? Jamie Green. Indeed, and that is why I know we are all looking forward to uh, Group 7, which is uh, my set of amendments on reviewing of the licensing scheme. Uh, so, at least if, if, we don't, if members do not support 77, which I urge my, my colleague to push, they will at least consider the next group as, when, as and when we come to it. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Yes, could the member please clarify whether he is pressing or withdrawing Amendment 13? Pressing. Pressing. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, I now call Amendment 14 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I now call Amendment 15 in the name of Fulton McGregor, already debated with Amendment 13. Fulton McGregor, to move or not move? It moves to the no, sir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 13. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Fulton McGregor, already debated with Amendment 13. Fulton McGregor to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 77 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 13. Russell Finlay to move or not move? It moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be division, and I ask that you cast your votes now. The vote is now closed. Uh, Greg Hoy, who is joining us remotely. 
Uh, sorry, Deputy Presiding Officer, and my app wouldn't uh, refresh. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Hoy. Uh, that has been noted. Point of order, uh, Liz Smith. And I would have voted yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smith, and that will be noted and to be recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 77 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 43. No, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 18 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? I'll move. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 13. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 13. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Fulton McGregor, already debated with Amendment 13. Fulton McGregor to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 30 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 5. Katie Clark to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amem Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will be a division, and I would ask members to cast their votes now. The vote is now closed.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 34 in the name of Katie Clark is yes, 45, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And we now move to Group 7, entitled Review and Report on Operation of Provisions. I call Amendment 78 in the name of Janie, Jamie Green, grouped with Amendments 87, 88 and 89. I draw members' attention uh, to the fact that if Amendment 88 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 89 due to a preemption. I call on Jamie Green to move Amendment 78 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this whole group, uh, I, I'll try and give you enough time to have a good cup of tea, those that are leaving the chamber, but I won't spend too long on it, so keep your eyes out for the divisions. Um, it's about the review uh, of the operation of the licence scheme. We've had quite a robust chat about the nature of what the scheme might look like. People have shared their opinions and views. Um, but what I would like to do is put on the face of the bill uh, a duty on ministers uh, as soon as is practicable uh, to lay before Parliament a report on the operation of the fireworks licensing scheme. Uh, effectively, uh, Amendment uh, 78 uh, asks uh, three things to happen in that review, uh, and in my view, they will be much needed given the nature of the debate that we've had today. The report must include information about the effectiveness of the fireworks licensing scheme. Uh, the uh, reason for that, I think, is self-explanatory. Is the licensing scheme working as intended? Is the fee being charged too high, too low? Is it prohibitive? Uh, is the process bureaucratic, uh, burdensome, uh, and so on? There, there are many things that the government could look at. I haven't been specific uh, in that. The second thing I ask the government to do is to report on the number of people who have applied for a fireworks licence. And I think that's important because we know uh, the scale of the market at the moment. Uh, fireworks sales in Scotland a couple of years ago were worth about £13 million. That number probably has risen given the popularity of them in, in recent years. I think what we must know in any review is how many people are applying for a licence on an annual basis. And the information that will be taken from that will be extremely helpful as to whether the, the licence scheme is a success or not, indeed whether the legislation is a success or not. That will be one of the key metrics in analysing uh, whether this bill has worked as it intended. But the third and most important uh, duty that it will put on ministers is a 2C, and that is whether there is any evidence that the licensing scheme is contributing to improving firework safety. We are told by ministers that that is the very essence of the bill, it is to improve firework safety, and this licensing scheme is central and key to that. Well, I would like to know if that be the case. There should be a duty on ministers to undertake a piece of work around that. Uh, amendments uh, 87, 88 and effectively in 89 as well are somewhat consequential to that. They outline uh, as a result of that report what changes ministers propose, uh, that consultation uh, should take place and that they will then report to Parliament and Amendment 88 specifies the time period when, uh, of which, uh, of what I call the reporting period. Uh, and I think it's a reasonable uh, uh, basis. It's three years from the date of royal assent. So effectively, if the law passes next Wednesday, three years thereafter, the government will have undertaken this review and come back to Parliament or indeed uh, future parliaments. Um, and I think I, I'm hoping that this post legislative scrutiny that I, I try to introduce at stage two, um, but I think the committee was rather split on. Um, uh, I hope that this redraft will be uh, easier for, for the ministers to accept, and I don't think they would find it unreasonable. And I would ask members to uh, support it. Thank you. I now call on the minister to respond. Thank you. When the bill was introduced, the Scottish Government set out our intention that a full review of the measures introduced through the bill would be undertaken once they took effect. So following scrutiny by the Criminal Justice Committee at Stage 1, I recognise that having this enshrined within the legislation strengthens this commitment and provides reassurance regarding the contents of any review and the time frame for this taking place. So I was therefore pleased to support amendments that were brought forward at Stage 2. Uh, they are now included in Section 44A of the Bill, and this requires Scottish Ministers to report on the operation of the Act within five years of the Act receiving royal assent, and for this to include information on proceedings and convictions, data for relevant offences, 
incident data, as well as the views and experiences of people and their communities. And this five-year time frame provides enough time for meaningful data to be recorded and reported, provides for the lived experience of people to be reflected as part of the review, and ensures that the Scottish Government is held to account. And this will ensure a comprehensive and a constructive review of the operation of the Act, encompassing all relevant parts. Now, Amendment 78, brought forward by Mr Green, requires an additional review solely of the licensing scheme, and in particular, a need to include evidence of the scheme's impact on improving firework safety. And that amendment would, uh, Amendment 87, would require that the report to Parliament on the operation of the Act must also set out what changes, if any, will be made to the Act following a review. Now, I understand that these amendments have been lodged to ensure that the licensing scheme meets its objectives, um, that it works in practice and as intended, and to add to the review requirements for the Act as a whole, building on Section 44A. However, for the reasons that I've outlined, I believe that the review requirements already within the Bill are robust and appropriate, and so I don't consider these amendments necessary. And a review of the licensing scheme, which is, of course, a core provision within the Bill, will be required to take place as part of that review of the Act as a whole. And so I don't believe it's necessary as a separate component on the face of the Bill. Any learning or areas of improvement that are identified in the review of the Act will be fully considered and will form part of the report to Parliament as a standard, and where appropriate adjustments and amendments will be made to how the provisions are operating in practice, and if required, to relevant regulations made under the Act to which affirmative procedure will apply. And this will enable, of course, further parliamentary scrutiny before any changes are made. So in addition, focusing specifically on legislative changes to the Act, as opposed to operational changes, I don't believe that Amendment 87 would achieve the intended outcome. And due to the reasons I've outlined, I can't support that amendment. Moving on to Amendments 88 and 89, they seek to change the timescale for the review of operations of the Act, requiring it to be carried out within three years of the Act uh, receiving royal assent, as opposed to the five years that's currently provided for. It's expected that if the Bill is passed, the licensing provisions will come into force over the first two years following royal assent, and therefore the five-year reporting period following royal assent provides three years in which to gather the required information and monitor and report on any change. Reducing that uh, reporting period to three years would only provide just one year of the operation of the system in which to gather the required information. I don't think this would be enough time to gather meaningful data uh, for that to be recorded and reported, and therefore for a comprehensive and constructive review of the operation of the Act, encompassing all parts uh, to take place. I'll give way. Russell Finlay. Uh, I, I do wonder whether the... Um What's been proposed, which is, if I understand it correctly, uh, the two years of license to, for the license to be put into place, and then three years thereafter there will be some kind of review. But that's assuming, presumably, that this all goes as well and as intended. However, surely there's a necessity to bring this forward in the strong or possible likelihood that things could go wrong and it needs a look at a lot quicker. Minister. Well, I don't share the member's very pessimistic attitude to how this will be rolled out. And I would reiterate to him that we need the appropriate time in order to gather the data to make it meaningful. So I would say that uh, the previous time period is striking the right balance there. Um, moving on, presiding officer, I can sympathise with the intention behind Amendment 88. And I can understand the member's desire for a rolling review period every five years. Um, but I can't support the proposal to reduce the reporting period. And, of course, I can assure the member that the ongoing effectiveness of all policies will be continually monitored. So I'd ask uh, Mr Green not to press these amendments, and if he does, I would ask members not to support them. I call Jamie Green to wind up and to press and withdraw Amendment 78. Thank you. Can I thank members for their contributions? I, I guess uh, there, there are two points I want to make. One is that I welcome clarification that, that a review of the licence licensing scheme specifically will form part of a wider review of the bill as is detailed in section 44a which is a wider report on operation the act which i do also appreciate is, is some way beyond where we were at in the first draft of the bill i think my, my problem with this is, is is the second point is that this is a one-off report on the operation of the act and whilst 
this government has given a commitment to do so uh, by not future-proofing it in the way that I'm seeking to do in my amendments. There is no requirement on future governments thereafter to perform any operation on the Act or any part therein, including the licensing scheme. And I think that's actually a bit of a miss. I think we could have addressed that had we spotted that earlier. Indeed, I, had we had time, I probably would have amended separately uh, Section 44A. Uh, so I don't really see the problem as to why Amendment 88 in my name ensures that that process is an iterative one and a continuous one, and that future governments, whatever their makeup and colour, are required to review uh, the effectiveness of this bill. So I, I wonder what happens thereafter. What happens after that one-off report um, if no future government decides to perform that piece of work, which is where I saw the gap? I do accept, however, that Amendment 78 uh, may not be necessary if it falls under the remit of, uh, amend, uh, of Section 44A. So, based on that, therefore, I will push, uh, not push uh, uh, Amendment 78 or, or withdraw as is necessary. Um, but there are other amendments in this group which I uh, may move when asked. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green seeks to withdraw Amendment uh, 78. Does any member object? No members objecting. So Amendment 78 is withdrawn. We now move to Group 8, entitled Changes to Dates of Supply and Use. And I call Amendment 79 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendments 80 and 81. And I, uh, I call on Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 79 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you. I move Amendment 79 in my name. There had been a lot of debate at stage two about the 57 days in the bill where fireworks are permitted um, with a licence. Um, some of the 57 days cover festivals such as Diwali, Visaki and Chinese New Year, um, as well as the typical bonfire at night as well. Um, I, I, on reflection, in terms of the discussion I had with the Minister at stage two, one of the things I didn't fully understand about the selection of the 57 Ds was well, you wouldn't maybe expect there to be public displays um, in some of those festivals rather than mean specific days where people can let fireworks off. I mean, just for those who are maybe hearing this for the first time, I think it's important to note that in, in Visaki, for example, which would be one of the 57 Ds, anyone could set a firework off. You know, uh, you don't have to just celebrate that, that festival. So th th this section of the bill just seems a little bit odd to me. Um, and I fear it may unravel a bit. Um, so I did want to have this exchange again at stage um, three. And uh, ministers can obviously add more days to the 57 days um, should, uh, under a statutory instrument, should they feel that there should be additions for whatever reason. Um, well, as I support the reduction in the number of days in which fireworks can be used, I didn't really feel that it went far enough, and I also didn't feel it was all that logical. It's unclear to me why bonfire period is set as two full weeks, given that bonfire night is one evening, and we could have covered it the full seven days with a lesser period, as, as well, obviously, as it puts increased pressure on the fire service and the police for the whole two weeks. And similarly, I don't believe that fireworks celebrations to celebrate New, New Year begin as early as Boxing Day, so I adjusted this amendment from stage two by excluding New Year, but I still wanted to have the exchange about those two periods, which are selected as part of the 57 days. I do note that one of the briefings that members have had from the Dogs Trust, it asked for a reduction of the, on the number of days that fireworks can be used and also sold, um, pointing out that shortening these windows will significantly reduce the negative impact of fireworks on animal welfare and vulnerable people, and there are also members of society who we've heard from who can uh, find fireworks distressing those with PTSD or those with autism. So to that end, Amendment 79 shortens the fireworks that can be sold during the bonfire period from the 27th to the 10th and uh, to November the 27th of October until the 4th of November, and that's the supply of fireworks. I will say to the Minister before she says it, um, I'm not really sure why it's the 4th of November and not the 5th, so I would concede that point. You should probably still allow for the sale of fireworks or on the 5th of November. But Amendment 80 shortens the period allowed for use from the 27th of October to the, of the, to the 12th of November to a shorter period of the 30th of October to the 6th of November. So it's kind of one week around bonfire season, which makes more sense to me. Um, so it does shorten the overall period. And similarly, Amendment 81 changes the allowed period from the 26th of December 
in the 20th of January, which it is at the moment, to the 31st of January and the 2nd of December, which, in my experience, that is when fireworks tend to be used. And again, I believe that that reduction is supported by animal welfare organisations. Um, a close presiding officer at that, and I would be uh, helpful if the Minister could address for the purposes of particularly those members who have not been party to this debate to say a bit more about why those 57 days have been selected and why such an extensive period over bonfire season and New Year. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Can I thank uh, Pauline McNeill for raising these amendments? These are further to two quite substantial uh, sections that I tried to add at stage two around changes to the uh, dates around the restrictions around the supply and use of fireworks. I think it raised a whole uh, can of worms when we debated this. Um, it, it became quite clear from the beginning that it was a somewhat arbitrary nature to the dates that were selected. Um, the government clearly doesn't want to ban fireworks altogether or just restrict it to public displays, as has been suggested by some, some stakeholders. It is trying to come up with a mechanism that allows private use in one's own back garden. But what it's done in doing so has created a series of dates defined in law when shops can sell and when people can use those fireworks. That, way, that does, I'm afraid, raise a, a whole range of issues, which I think this bill have not, has not addressed and I know have not been fixed as we've gone through the process. Apart from the arbitrary nature, what effectively we're doing is creating 57 days of the year where you are legally allowed to set off fireworks that you have purchased privately. I think in many people's minds, uh, the fireworks only seem to go off at certain times of year. There are problematic times of year around bonfire night, um, around uh, New Year's Eve. Um, but effectively, we're now saying that there are 57 dates, including f feasts, religious feasts, which actually move in date. So that in itself makes no sense. But by, by doing so, we've also identified specific religious festivals, but excluded others. And that's the point I raised at stage two, when I don't think any satisfactory response was given to that. Um, I think by excluding certain uh, religious or indeed secular festivals from that specified dates, the government is opening itself up to future challenge. And I hope it's not the case, but I do raise that warning now that it could very well take place. Um, uh, just in one second, because I want to mention uh, Ms McNeill's amendments. I don't support amendments 79 and 80, and I think the first one is for the reasons she accepts, is that it seems a bit odd to restrict the sale of fireworks on fireworks day itself. So I appreciate that may be a, a technical uh, boo-boo to use that word. But um, I, Amendment 80 is, is an interesting one, because I think what she is trying to do is tighten that window of use. But there may be reasons why, for example, the 5th of November, you cannot let off fireworks, whether related or other, other reasons. So I think that flexibility that the Minister is offering is, is actually quite helpful. What I do support, though, is Amendment 81. And the reason uh, for that is, we understand the period around bonfires night, but I'm not convinced that allowing people to let off fireworks as early as the 26th of December to celebrate New Year's Eve, which is some five days later, makes any sense. I would have been much in favour of tightening that window as Ms McNeill strives to. So if she does move Amendment 81, I would strongly uh, ask colleagues to support it because I think it does tighten up that window of opportunity. Um, but I think just in, in closing, presiding officer, um, what this whole section raises is one of the odd bits of the bill where uh, retailers and consumers are given two different periods of time when they can sell and use fireworks. I think this, that will result in confusion amongst the wider public. It will result potentially in uh, people taking action that they've been excluded uh, and discriminatory. I don't know what impact assessment on equalities was ever done when these dates were selected. And I really hope there are no other religious organisations out there who are wondering why on earth have we been excluded from the dates and others included. I mean, if they come forward, it will be too late by then because the bill will have passed uh, by next Wednesday. I hope they will get in touch with us before then, if that be the case. Um, but I think the, the issue of confusion will arise, and I hope the government has some robust plans and public awareness around those dates, because the main issue is that what happens when someone calls the police and says, my neighbour's letting off fireworks in the garden? Will they know whether that's part of the in date or the out date, whether that's the legal date or the illegal date? And thereafter, what on earth are the police going to do? Realistically, are trading standards officers going to come knock on your neighbour's door? Are, are the police officers fully resourced to come out and knock on your door? Or are they just going to say thanks for telling us and nothing will happen? We already know that prosecution rates are extremely low 
in other fireworks related offences. And I have severe concerns that nothing will change the result of these restrictions and dates. I can see why the stakeholders who are writing to us, and, 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 and it's right to do so, uh, support the idea of narrowing those dates. But I think the way that the government has gone about it in this bill will create some serious problems. I would hate to say I told you so, but I fear I may do. Thank you. And before I call the Minister to respond, I would just say there is quite a lot of conversation going on in the Chamber, which makes it a bit more difficult for every member to hear exactly what is going on. I call the Minister to respond. Thank you, President Officer. First, I would like to emphasise that the permitted periods in the Bill are broadly in line with existing traditional firework periods. And this is when most retailers in Scotland are permitted to sell fireworks and when the use of fireworks by the general public is most prevalent. I'll give away. Russell Finlay. Just in relation to the dates, I just wonder what the Minister would say to our American friends who would find themselves criminalised in Scotland were they to use fireworks on the 4th of July. <laughs> Minister? Um, not if they were to employ a private um, company to do that display for them. So, Amendment 79, as brought forward by Ms McNeill, looks to shorten the permitted days of supply over the bonfire period to nine days, as opposed to the 15 days currently provided for in the Bill. And the Bill will, for the very first time, presiding officer, set out permitted periods when people in Scotland can be supplied with fireworks. And we've set out the Bill in a period which we think reflects that fair balance based on consultation between the desire to celebrate special days in our communities while still curtailing the general supply and use of fireworks. So I believe that limiting the supply period further could risk a situation where people have a very limited number of days to purchase fireworks and are inadvertently encouraged to store them in domestic settings. And it also risks squeezing the supply chain over the busiest period for fireworks purchases. And this could cause retailers to overstock and lead to safety issues around storage as well. So if there is evidence that the permitted periods of supply should be reduced further in future, the bill provides an ability to do this via secondary legislation. And so I don't support Amendment 79 and encourage Ms McNeill not to press it. So moving on to Amendments 80 and 81, our intention in introducing restricted days of use is to address the negative impacts of unpredictable fireworks use while retaining periods during which fireworks may be used appropriately by the general public. And it was recognised that setting permitted periods for use provides flexibility to allow celebrations to go ahead on or around their date and allows for postponement or delays due to inclement weather, which I believe was uh, mentioned by Mr Green earlier, um, or indeed any other type of unsafe conditions. So amendments 80 and 81, which were brought forward by Ms McNeill, look to shorten the permitted days of use over the bonfire period to eight days and the new year period to three days. And these amendments would reduce the permitted days that fireworks can be used as set out in the bill by almost a quarter. Now, there is a fine line between introducing permitted periods to reduce the negative effects on our vulnerable populations while allowing for the enjoyment which members of the public can and do get from using fireworks. And this is while also reducing the impact on business and ensuring that adequate safety measures remain in place. So I believe that limiting the period further could risk a situation where people have uh, a very limited number of days to use fireworks and are inadvertently encouraged them to use them in unsafe conditions. I'll give way. Jamie Green. Just responding and reacting to what the Minister is saying, I mean, are we now in a position where there are nearly two months of the year where it will be legal to use fireworks as a private citizen? But on top of that, Ministers reserve the right in the legislation to add to that, more so if they've been challenged, for example, legally. So simply adding and adding to it rather than reducing it. But above all of that remains the bizarre situation that if you can afford to employ a private company to let off fireworks in your garden, you can do that at any time of the year. Can you see why some of the organisations who are writing to us with concerns about the proposals think that this completely undermines the whole proposition? Uh, and why are we creating a two-tier system that those who can't afford to pay private companies will not be allowed to let off fireworks, but those who can afford, and they're quite expensive, to, let, to pay companies to, to let off big fancy displays can do that at any time of the year. I mean, what was the rationale behind that? And surely the Minister will admit that it makes absolutely no sense. Minister. 
Well, it was an attempt to balance, um, as the member will understand, all the different interests that are relevant in this debate. And the careful um, consideration that this was given um, by the review group has um, presented, for the most part, in the recommendations and now the provisions that we now have in the Bill. So in the case of these amendments, this would also mean that fireworks are available to purchase for a number of days before they're permitted to be used. And I'm concerned that this could lead to issues around stockpiling. And they're permitted days of use of the Bill, so they deliberately extend slightly beyond when fireworks can be supplied. And this is to avoid that situation where people um, buy fireworks, perhaps towards the very end of their supply period, and then they're not able to use them on that day, for example, due to poor weather. So this minimises the likelihood of individuals needing to store fireworks from the last day of one permitted use period into the beginning of the next permitted use period, which um, could lead to safety concerns around storage of fireworks in domestic premises. I'll give way. Polly McNeill. Uh, thank you. I have always acknowledged that there is a balance to be struck in this. Um, does, the minister, does the Minister accept that the period in the Bill at the moment means that once it is commonly known that they are saying that you can set fireworks off for two weeks I, 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 during the bonfire season. And if that was to be encouraged, could you not see that that could potentially give rise to some of the problems that we've both been talking about, which is um, the pressures on the police and the fire service for two weeks, rather than what is a bonfire night has become much, much... I'm concerned, should you not be, that the government is encouraging a wider period of use? Minister. I don't accept that point because I think, as the member will recognise, because I know she uh, represents an area where there is a lot of fireworks misuse, that what we would previously have all underst understood maybe a, a few decades ago about bonfire night has now quite routinely turned into a bonfire season, if you like, and it, it has definitely extended over that period. So Ms McNeill's amendments, um, they would uh, amount to a 16% decrease in the period in which fireworks can be supplied and a 25% reduction in the days that they can be used. And um, the balance that was struck in here, um, the work that went on in order to balance all of this with the key stakeholders, I, I fear that in reducing it that much at this point, that would render all of the work that had gone before in order to get to that point um, meaningless, if you like. But I would say to the member that this is a starting point it's a starting point in the culture change journey that we are on. Thank you. And I call on Polly McNeill to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment number 79. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm, not going to, I'm going to seek permission to withdraw amendment 79 for the reasons I already gave. Um, I just want to summarise um, on this debate. Um, I do think this is an element of the bill that was, is going to be very confusing for people. And one of the oddities of it is if you have an event that falls within the 57 days, whether it's a birthday or a gender reveal, you can uh, lawfully set off fireworks. But if you have any of those events out with the 57 days, you can't take advantage of it. Uh, also, I would have thought that uh, of the, of the uh, festivals uh, that, that are concluded in the 57 at days that they would attend to be public displays and not people setting fireworks off in their back garden. I mean, I, I've been to Visaki and the Valley events, they've been publicly organised, um, but I would, I'd be happy to stand corrected on that. So I think this is, this, this, the reason I brought this to stage three um, for debate is that I think members need to be aware when they're voting for this bill there's an awful lot that the public can be confused about. I appreciate that the Minister is saying that a lot of work went into this, and I would not deny that. Many stakeholders, you can see so much work has gone into this. But our job is to make sure that the general public see this as workable legislation, and that when we pass it, they understand exactly what it does. And I have real concerns about that. I do, have, I do acknowledge... Yes, I will, of course. Yeah. Minister? I, t I hear what the member is saying, um, and I, I understand that she, she wants to raise these concerns. Would the member accept, then, the, the licensing scheme and, and asking the public when they're applying for a licence uh, to undertake the training course, which will, will teach them about where and when they can use fireworks, how to store them and, and use them safely and lawfully, will go some way to addressing the member's concerns? Polly McNeill. Y yes, I do acknowledge that if, after the training course, you remember the 57 days of Diwali Visaki. Chinese New Year, etc. 
And, but bearing in mind, it's an offence to set a firework off out with the 57 days. But what I was drawing attention to is the odd element of that, which is anyone could take advantage of setting a firework off lawfully in their back garden on any of the 57 days. You do not have to be celebrating any of these events. And that just seems an odd thing, because you can't do other parts. That would be an offence to do out with the 57 days. And I just think it's one of the things in the bill that could uh, unravel. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, um, I seek withdrawal of Amendment 79. I seek not to move Amendment 80, um, but I will move Amendment 81. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Polly McNeill seeks to withdraw Amendment 79. Does any member object? No member objects. Amendment 79 is therefore withdrawn. And I will call Amendment 80 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 79, and Polly McNeill has indicated that she is not moving. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. Yep. Uh, I then call Amendment 81 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 79. Polly McNeill to move or not move? Move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> Rachel Hamilton for a point of order. Officer, I would have voted yes. And, and Ms Hamilton, could you explain if there was a problem with your app or, or what the reason was that you're making the point of yes. order? Yes, presiding officer, I couldn't connect at the time. It didn't come up as an option for me to vote. OK, thank you, Ms Hamilton. We will ensure that your vote is recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 81 in the name of Polly McNeill is yes, 45, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I will now suspend proceedings for five minutes to allow uh, for comfort breaks. Thank you.
OK, thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, we will now return to uh, the stage three, and we're now at group nine, entitled Firework Control Zones. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Katie Clark, group with Amendments 36, 82, 1 and 83. I call on Katie Clark to move Amendment 35 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. I move amendments 35 and 36, which would enable local authorities to designate an area as a firework control zone in which fireworks could not be used by any person, and so no person or organisation would be exempt. This means that fireworks would be banned, and nobody, whether they were a professional organisation or an individual, would be able to use them. I believe this is what many who have been campaigning for fireworks reform are actually looking for. I appreciate that the Scottish Government has taken heed of the arguments made at stages one and two and added the provision that private operators will not be exempt within the proposed firework control zone, which is stronger than what was in the bill previously. But it still means that public displays will be permitted within those areas. And I would ask the Minister um, to elaborate on this and to give clarity as to what the definition of a public display will be. So my amendment stipulates that fireworks would effectively be banned in any area that a local authority des designates as a control zone. That could be a small area, that could be a matter of a number of streets, or it could be the vicinity of a particular facility where the use of fireworks is likely to cause concern. Organisations such as the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Blue Cross, the National Autistic Society and the Scottish Community Safety Network support the amendments. And I think that speaks to um, the fireworks um, harmful impact, whether that's a public display or whether they are um, set off by a private op op operative or indeed an individual. Um, I would ask that um, the Cabinet Secretary perhaps come back um, and give an explanation as to why there hasn't been provision in the Bill for local authorities um, to take such action, given the extensive concerns that have been raised by communities. Um, and of course, um, I completely understand um, the reasons why um, public displays um, may be something that people want. The Minister said at stage two that public displays foster community spirit and bring people together. I agree with that. And what's proposed in this amendment is not an outright ban. Displays would still be possible outside of the areas where local authorities had designated um, they should not be used. Um, and I therefore move Amendment 35 and 36. Thank you. I now call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 82 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Um, my Amendment 82 tries to seek a similar objective to uh, Katie Clark's amendments. It does it in a slightly di a different way. Uh, mine states that when designating a firework control zone or amending a zone, a local authority must specify whether uh, exempt exemptions apply or do not. It gives them a little bit extra flexibility uh, to the proposals uh, from Katie Clark. But effectively, what we're doing here what both Labour and these benches are doing now, and what we also try to do at stage two, is to ensure that this concept of a firework control zone is, is a genuine no firework zone. I think for the reasons that have been outlined already, is that the expectation out there, and we heard it right at the beginning of the debate from Mr Cole Hamilton, was that um, people want something to be done. This bill doesn't do it in the way that people think will do it. And I think that's a, a risk that we must flag with people because, as I said, we've read some of the letters that we've had already from people saying, please support the legislation, and I can see why they would want us to. What they maybe don't understand is that if you read the bill and its technical uh, detail, cover to cover, as it is currently drafted before these amendments are considered, there is a, the real risk that there may not be genuine firework-free zones in Scotland. In fact, what we've tried to do is give that power back to local authorities to make localised decisions on the size of the zone, the length of the zone, the reasons for it, and that people could make applications for a zone. We've tried in so many different ways to amend this bill through stages two and three. Um, and for that reason, I would ask uh, members to support either of the options presented before them uh, in Group 9 to create uh, these genuine firework uh, uh, control zones. And that would really appeal directly to those watching this, whether it's those in the farming community, whether it's the animal welfare charities 
especially those who have premises and venues, whether it's the, the Scottish Autism who wrote to us and, and said, you know, thanks for your efforts. But th they, are, they, are, they are disappointed that there's no technical ability in the bill to create what I would call a firework-free zone or a no-firework zone, as it should have been. It's a real missed opportunity here. Uh, and these firework control zones, we have no idea what, what, they're going to be look, what they're going to look like. We have no idea what the criteria will be, or who can apply for them and how, and what the appeals process will look like. We don't know how many of them there will be. They don't know if there will be a network or a patchwork. We also don't know what the effect that will have if one local authority decides to have lots of them and the neighbouring local authority doesn't. What will happen to the displacement issue of people letting off fireworks? Too many unanswered questions for my liking to get to this stage in this bill. And for that reason, we have put in a, a small but important amendment, as, as has Ms Clark. Uh, uh, um, uh, and I would uh, ask members to look favourably upon them if they are moved. Thank you. And I call Polly McNeill to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I believe this is a really important part of the bill that gives a mechanism to create a control zone where there should be no fireworks set off. Um, well, the, 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 there should be no fireworks set off as far as the licensing regime is concerned, and the question is whether or not the government want to go further. Um, can I begin by thanking the Minister and her team uh, for working with me on Amendment 1, which is about publicising firework control zones? Um, I think it's really important that, the, that it's known um, where uh, fire control zones are, the date at which they apply, uh, what the boundaries of the zone are, and what is permissible and what is not permissible. Um, it's been a really constructive part of the process, and I'm pleased to bring this amendment before the Parliament today. Um, the Government, uh, rightly so, in, in this amendment, um, as I do, want to make it clear that the general public and need to know exactly what a fire control zone is and where it is. Um, and this sets it out on the face um, of the bill, and I think in a very, use, in a very useful way. Um, it's one of the issues I felt pretty strongly about, so I'm really pleased to be able to speak to Amendment 1 in my name. Um, on Amendment 83, um, again, this is an exchange we had at Stage 2, um, which is about... Um, who can apply for a firework control um, zone um, for it to be designated. Um, I still have concerns um, that if local authorities decide not to proceed with a fire control zone. And, uh, well, there's a series of assertions made in this debate. <laughs> to some extent, none of us really know how this bill will be applied. Um, but I'm asserting that I, I would like uh, individuals and community groups to be able to put before a local authority, should they not act, in communities like Paulette Shields, which has been discussed uh, by the Minister and during the process of statute, and other, other communities um, who may feel that it has been overlooked. Um, I feel actually quite strongly about this, this amendment. Um, and whilst I appreciate it was a point made, I think, by Philip McGregor at stage two, that uh, members of the public could make representation to councillors to bring it before the local authority and accept that as one route. But I think if we also believe in community empowerment, I think there should be another route, uh, which is, after all, only a request for the local authority to look at it. Uh, and after that, it's for the local authority um, to decide um, whether or not it's appropriate. Um, if we want the bill to work, I really think it's a really important aspect of it. We must make the fire control zones a central element of the legislation. It must be workable. Others must be able to ask for it. And communities must know that it's a major tool, if you like, in the way of controlling fireworks in their areas. And for that reason, um, I conclude on that and hope the government will consider at stage three supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I call the minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So uh, I'll start off by saying that I do recognise the strength of feeling that firework control uh, zone provision has, ra has raised. I, I welcome the constructive discussions that have taken place on this point, and I realise that for some members, the provision on firework control zones doesn't go far enough. But I have considered the options in great detail here, um, at great length, prior to the introduction of the bill, and again when I was reflecting on the recommendations of the criminal 
Justice Committee um, report at stage one. So, as with many aspects of the Bill, there is that delicate balance to be achieved. And on the one hand, there is a need for further reducing um, unpredictable, although possibly legitimate, firework use, whilst on the other hand, ensuring there are limited but necessary exemptions where appropriate. And so, as a result of these considerations, I brought forward an amendment at stage two to remove the exemption for professional operators to deliver private displays in a designated control zone. And this means that fireworks may only be used by a professional operator in a designated control zone where this is for the purpose of a public firework display. And this amendment was agreed unanimously by the committee and it recognises, as I think we all do, the value of local organised um, public displays and what they can bring to communities. So, turning to the amendments uh, 35, 36 and 82, together seek to remove the firework control zone exemptions that will apply consistently across Scotland. And amendment 35 would mean that there can be no use of fireworks at all in any designated control zone. So, the current exemptions ensure that enforcement bodies are able to continue to carry out their necessary duties in a designated zone. And they also allow for businesses engaged in the manufacture or supply of fireworks to carry out vital safety checks as part of due diligence, and that they can continue to do so. So it's vital that these exemptions are retained. The intention of Amendments 36 and 82, uh, while approaching it in slightly different ways, is that each individual local authority on a case-by-case -case basis could determine different exemptions for different control zones. And amendment 36 would allow local authorities to designate areas where no exemptions would apply, meaning fireworks could not be set off at all, or where only certain groups of individuals are permitted to set fireworks off. So, presiding officer, it will be a criminal offence to use fireworks in a control zone unless exempt. And given this, it is vital that the exemptions are consistently applied in all areas, and in particular, so that those involved in public firework displays and others can understand the law, which is a point that we've been talking about uh, a little bit already today, and how it applies to their activities. And enabling these um, very small variations, as well as very large differences between the position in different areas, I think would add unnecessary complexity to these zones. And that's something that I'm really, really keen that we avoid. I'll give way. Jamie Green. I'm not sure if Ms Clark is going to mention the same point, but I mean, I think that what we're concerned about here is that all the stakeholders who are looking at this as the great panacea of solving localised problems, and, and there are hot spots. We all know where those hot spots are, where there is antisocial behaviour. They think these firework control zones are going to solve that problem. I don't have a problem with local authorities making different decisions based on the needs of the local area in this scenario, in this instance. I cannot, for the life of me, see why we say, yes, you can create a firework control zone, but the government has a set of national exemptions that apply to all the people that we think should still be able to let off fireworks. What is wrong with giving local authorities that decision-making to say, no, this is a genuine no-firework zone, this is addresses a very specific localised need in my community, and we will not allow fireworks at all in that zone? I don't think that's a fine balance. I think that's quite clear. And I can't for the life of me work out why the government wouldn't support that. Minister. Well, I think it is part of this balance in, in trying to achieve the objectives of the bill and balance the interests involved. And I think in terms of um, certainly uh, the public events, so if that's what we're specifically talking about, in terms of them still being allowed in a firework control zone, I thought about this very carefully and, and long. So when I came to the chamber at stage one, I said to the members that were here that there were a couple of areas where I genuinely wanted to hear what members thought. Um, so that was on um, the exemptions for private companies and also for public displays. I listened very carefully uh, to what members said to me on, on that point and what stakeholders have said. And I did think about it very carefully, and I think it is a fine balance, and it's obviously up to the members to decide whether I did, in the end, um, get this to the right point. But I genuinely felt that public displays are not where the issue lies. And so I think by preventing them, we are not achieving the right balance. And that, and that was why I came to that decision. I'll give away. Katie Minister, for giving way. But the intention of my amendment is to enable local authorities to use their discretion. So, for example, the types of situation where such a ban might be appropriate would, for example, be perhaps a, a facility run by combat stress, um, where a, there are veterans who might be um, distressed 
um, by fireworks um, near a P, um, T, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder care facility or near an animal rescue um, centre or stables. Surely there is a case for a complete ban where the council feels that's appropriate in the particular circumstances. Minister. So, so that's where I don't agree, and I think I've just, I've just covered that. But in terms of public displays, and we did have an exchange on this at stage two, local authorities do have discretion. Um, in order to um, allow or to not allow certain public displays. Um, it's not in this piece of legislation, but they, but they do have that. And I wonder if that will give the member some comfort on that point. So on Amendment 82, uh, would give discretion about whether or not a public firework display were allowed in a particular area. And I, I am very reluctant, I would say, to de deprive communities of the benefits of organised public display displays and, and the benefits that they can bring to communities. Um, and in many cases, local authorities are already able to determine the suitability of these displays in a particular place. Um, so that's through their public entertainment licence processes. So I can't support those amendments. Uh, amendment 1 sets out that a local authority must take reasonable steps to inform those consulted about what it means in practice when a zone is created, amended or removed. This was in line with the policy intent for the firework control zones and how it's expected that the publication of a decision on and information about firework control zones will work in practice. I'm grateful to Ms. M Ms. McNeil for her engagement on this issue, and I'm pleased to be able to support that amendment. Amendment 83, that seeks to provide a formal process for community groups to instigate consideration of a firework control zone and a duty on the local authority to respond to it. I do sympathise with this amendment. Um, I share the members' views on the importance of community empowerment, and we did have quite a long exchange on this point uh, at stage two. Uh, section 30 and 31 of the bill enable Scottish ministers to make further regulations about firework control zones and require that local authorities must have regard to any guidance that is issued about these zones. So I believe that such guidance, co-designed with the local authorities and communities, is a more appropriate route uh, than this amendment for setting out that further detail on the local procedures for control zones, including procedures for involving local communities. And should this uh, prove to be insufficient, it will be possible to make regulations to strengthen those requirements in the future. Uh, but I think to include it in the bill at this stage uh, would remove flexibility before there has been an opportunity for local approaches to be developed and also tested by those who know their communities best. I'll give away. Pauline McNeill. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive reply, but surely it's quite a simple matter. If a request was to put before a local authority, and I did reflect on what you said, I did actually read their official report and adjusted it to see maybe you might accept that form of formulation. But the local authority can still say no. It's just a request. It doesn't deny the local authority any powers they don't already have. I, I, I really don't understand why ministers have got such difficulty with it. Minister. I think um, in terms of determining a process to give life, if you like, to the, the intention that the member has, I really do think that guidance is a more appropriate place to set that out because I fear that it would not be as simple as the member is describing for local authorities. And I think we do have to take that into account. And if I, um, if I can carry on, presiding officer, just to um, answer a point that Katie Clark asked me about in her contribution earlier. She was asking me about the definition of public displays and community groups. So um, we've taken quite a general approach on the definition. Uh, we've chosen a widely understood definition, one that's in use by local authorities at the moment, and it has a two-part test um, as part of that. So in order to be considered to be a public event, um, the organisation would have to be established, um, and it would have to have an identity, and the event would have to be open to the public. So I hope that sets the members' uh, mind at rest. Thank you. I call on Katie Clark to wind up and press her withdraw Amendment 35. I am grateful to the Minister for her further clarification. However, I think it is clear that the current legislative framework has not been effective, which is why the various campaigns have been campaigning for there to be the ability to have a complete ban of fireworks. Um, in terms of public events, I think a wide definition, as she described, um, that the events be established and open to the public actually reinforces the argument 
um, that we need to have the ability for local councils to intervene, to use their discretion, to use their knowledge of local communities and have the ability to say that there should be no fireworks use by any organisation in specific areas. And therefore, I will be moving Amendment 35 to the vote. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 35 in the name of Katie Clark is yes, 42, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 36 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with amendment 35. Katie Clark to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 36 in the name of Katie Clark is yes, 43, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 82 in the name of Jamie Green already debated with Amendment 35. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 82 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 43, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 1 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment 35. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I just confirm we are all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 35. Pauline McNeill to move or not moved. moved. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> I call Alexandra Burnett for a point of order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. But, uh, that locked me out. I would have abstained. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 83 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 17, no 64. There were 26 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 37 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. We move therefore to group 10, which is aggravation of offences relating to emergency workers. And I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Minister in a group of its own. Minister to move and speak to Amendment 38. Amendment 38 makes provision for a statutory aggravation in cases where fireworks and pyrotechnics are used against emergency workers. Where an offence is found to be aggravated, certain requirements will fall on the court. And this amendment does not require the court to impose a higher sentence, but discretion will continue to sit with the court in line with the general policy approach on sentencing. However, following the general approach on statutory aggravations that we've seen in other legislation, the court is required to consider whether an enhanced sentence is needed. And if the court decides it is not, then it must explain the reasons why. In addition, it will require courts to record when offences using fireworks and pyrotechnics against emergency workers have been found to be aggravated. And this will help us build the data and evidence over time as the extent of use being made of fireworks and pyrotechnics in offences against those who are risking life and limb in order to keep our communities safe. 
Presiding officer, I have welcomed the opportunity at each stage of the bill to hear from members on a number of very important issues of shared concern. And one of these issues has been how best to ensure the law has the necessary powers to allow the courts to deal with offending using fireworks and pyrotechnics against those workers who deal with personal risk to tackle emergency situations in the service of others. And I was therefore grateful to Jamie Green for bringing forward an amendment on this issue at stage two and for his willingness to engage with me in advance of stage three to ensure as a parliament that we got the detail of this amendment right. And as I said on previous occasions when this issue has been debated the courts, of course, already have the ability to determine the most appropriate sentence for those convicted of such offences by considering all the facts and the circumstances of each case. And on balance, however, I believe this amendment is the right thing to do. A statutory aggravation reflects the serious nature of this particular offending and ensures that the nature of this offending will be taken into account when determining the appropriate sentence. And it will also ensure appropriate recording of aggravated offences will take place. So I'd be very happy, presiding officer, if uh, the, the parliament would support amendment number 38. And I move the amendment. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, I'd be very happy if members supported it as well. This is arguably one of the more important amendments uh, that we talk about in the short remaining time we have. Um, no one in this chamber uh, can condone the use of fireworks or pyrotechnics as a weapon against our emergency service workers. We heard from stage one straight away, direct from those affected by this last year on bonfire night, just one night, never mind the other 56 that will happen. Eight fire crews, several police officers were attacked and injured by members of the public. Uh, three firefighters were injured. Uh, not just fireworks, people were chucking all sorts of things, golf clubs, bottles. But this happens every year, and we're told it happens every year. Um, I brought forward an amendment at stage two. It wasn't on the face of the bill when it was presented to us. Um, but I felt strongly about this, um, and I'm really pleased that the Minister has uh, given way on this. Um, I, I wouldn't say this is a win personally, or even a win for uh, these benches. This is a win for the emergency service workers, those defined in the Emergency Workers Act, those in the Police and Fire Reform Act, and also our friends in British Transport Police as well. Um, I think supporting this uh, government amendment today, which I put my name to in support sends a really strong message that this parliament will not accept uh, any form of abuse or attack on our hard-working emergency service workers, not just with fireworks, with anything else. We haven't outlawed golf balls as part of this bill, but it's completely unacceptable and we will send a strong message that the courts must take those uh, factors into account when sentencing and the full weight of the law will come down on them. I hope that sends a really strong and powerful message, particularly to the police officers and the fire service workers that we heard from and ambulance crews as well, who are being attacked, doing their job, trying to help people who are in difficult situations, people who have been injured, people that need help, people who have had accidents on nights when fireworks are used. Um, and this sends a really strong message that that is unacceptable and those who do that should be warned. Um, that they will face uh, the full weight of the law, and I hope uh, that this amendment does that. And, and, and what I hope more is that we'll actually see some proper prosecutions. There's no point passing legislation in words alone. I want to see uh, uh, people who commit these sorts of offences successfully prosecuted, and I hope that all stakeholders in the justice system will take, uh, take cognizance of that as we pass this. Minister, to wind up. Nothing further to add, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 40 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 42 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. 
I call Amendment 44 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 2. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. We move on to Group 11, which is Review of Existing Legislation, and I call Amendment 84 in the name of Jamie Green in a group of its own. Jamie Green, to move and speak to Amendment 84. Uh, thank you. I'll try and keep this brief. I think this amendment is quite self-explanatory. It's, it's similar in nature, but, but I've changed the wording of it for, to an amendment stage two that requires the government to do one fundamental thing, and that's a review of existing legislation insofar as they relate to the supply and use or, as the case is, misuse of fireworks and pyrotechnics articles. What I'm asking the Minister to do is if, a, is, if, as a result of that review, whether any legislation is being adequately implemented and enforced, and if not, what action will be taken to ensure that legislation is adequately implemented and enforced? That goes back to the previous amendment, which I'm pleased that the Parliament passed. There are nine other pieces of legislation going as far back as 1875, uh, right through to the fireworks miscellaneous Amendments Regulations Act 2021. There's a whole bunch of uh, uh, pieces of legislation out there which already govern the misuse of fireworks. So when we hear the frustrations from people that this bill is going to solve the problems of antisocial and problematic firework use, I should say to them there already is a lot of legislation out there that's not being used. The numbers speak for themselves. Uh, over the uh, last five years, there have been over 6,000 incidents uh, involving fireworks recorded by Police Scotland. Of those, 518 were recorded under the Explosive Substances Act um, and a number of others under the keeping of supplying of explosive legislation. Of those, uh, only 16 resulted in a criminal conviction, from 6,000, just 16. Last year alone, there were 974, so nearly 1,000 fireworks-related complaints to the police. There were 29 charges laid and zero criminal con convictions. Zero. The conversion rate from incidents being reported to charges being laid to successful prosecutions to people being punished for it is abominable as it is. What I'm asking ministers to do is to review all the pieces of legislation, not this Act, but all the existing pieces of legislation that already exist insofar as they relate to fireworks and pyrotechnics and their misuse and tell us whether or not they are comfortable and confident that, that legislation has been used to its full extent. That is the very least we can do. My previous version of this said that this, bill, this new bill that we are adding to the nine could not properly come into effect until that piece of work had taken place. I accept that that held back the bill. I accept that that was deemed to be incompetent. I have taken that out. All I am asking ministers is to simply do that piece of work after this bill passes. I cannot un understand why they would not want to do a full and proper review of all legislation that relates to fireworks and pyrotechnics. Because clearly, clearly all the laws that exist to protect people are not being used to their full extent. And that must be the source of frustration that so many in our communities are feeling. And that must be the source of frustration as to why they, want, why they think this bill is going to solve those problems. Let's tell them that there are many other pieces of legislation that the police could use, that the Crown Office uh, could use. There are so many other tools available to them that they should uh, be using to their full extent. And I, and I hope that this piece of work will raise awareness of that um, and hopefully lead to more prosecutions. In fact, we tried to amend the bill in, in many ways at the last stage about the nature of, of the, 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 the punishments and so on. But this amendment alone and this standalone group, um, I hope, will be a positive one, will be well received and a useful exercise um, that, that actually um, that puts this issue back on the table. And I, I look forward to hearing what others in the Minister has to say. Call the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I stated uh, during the Stage 2 proceedings, when a very similar amendment was proposed by the Member, my ministerial colleagues and I are always prepared to keep the law under review. And indeed, it is this willingness to review the law that has led us to introduce this bill. The bill already reflects a period of significant consultation and engagement with the public and stakeholders alongside careful consideration of all the evidence available. 
and of which a key component was examining the existing legislation. Uh, indeed, I point the member to the publicly available report from the Fireworks Review Group, and this includes a detailed section on existing legislation, regulation and enforcement, alongside a comprehensive annex setting out each piece of legislation, what it does and practical considerations. And it is the conclusion of this independent review group, as well as from the misuse of pyrotechnics stakeholder discussions, that there are clear gaps and therefore a need for further legislation. And the measures in the bill will give effect to that work. As I said, we're always prepared to keep the law under review, but I think it's unnecessary and inappropriate to place a statutory duty on ministers to conduct a further review and to lay it before Parliament within 12 months, when the previous work is the reason that we have brought forward this bill that's in front of Parliament today. So I'd ask Mr Green not to press his amendments, and if he does, I hope the members will not support it. Jamie Green to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 84. Uh, the Minister has just stated that it was a review of existing legislation and laws that led to this bill, and one sentence, then in another sentence said that this legislation fills in gaps in existing legislation. So clearly what hasn't happened is that that review of existing legislation has not led to any improvements at all in existing legislation being used to its full extent. It's okay plugging gaps, it's okay adding to legislation, but that review in no way actually solve the problem of existing legislation not being used to its full capabilities. And it is that which I'm seeking ministers to do. Um, I, it is that which I think it should be on the face of the bill, and it is that which I ask members to support. Uh, and I move Amendment 84. The question is that Amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> The result of the vote on amendment number 84 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 43, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. <coughs> we move to group 12, improvement of firework safety. And I call amendment 85 in the name of Jamie Green in a group of its own. Jamie Green to move and speak to amendment 85. Uh, thank you, President Austin. and thank members for their forbearance this afternoon. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground and raised some really important issues. Um, my last amendment is in a group of its own. It's about fire, uh, improvement of fireworks safety. We're told that that is what lies at the heart of this bill. So what a perfect opportunity to use a new piece of legislation that seeks to improve fireworks safety and putting in a part that seeks to do just that. The difference here, though, is, of course, I'm putting the onus back on ministers. Ministers in their policies and their proposals uh, to improve firework safety. I have a number of very specific asks of the government in this amendment. I would like them to develop an annual national safety campaign for fireworks. Sensible ask, not just coming from me, coming from even the fireworks industry itself. 
who you think would be completely against any such proposals. They want to see a firework annual safety plan. I also want ministers to publish their policy around the detection and apprehension of illegal fireworks. The reason for that is if, and it is a big if, there is a black market which does arise as a result of this legislation. We don't know. We've heard evidence that say there might be. I, I, I hope there isn't. But if there is, then what will the government do around the detection and apprehension of illegal fireworks? The third point is around the centralised approach to the reporting of the misuse of fireworks incidents. Uh, the problem we have at the moment, and the committee found that themselves at stage one, is it was almost impossible to identify the scale of the problem because it was either being underreported or reported to different stakeholders in different ways, whether that was the police, local authorities, uh, calling 101. People didn't understand whether what they were hearing or seeing around them was illegal or antisocial. I think that problem is going to exacerbate once this bill is passed, if it passes, uh, given the confusion around when you can and cannot let off fireworks or who can and cannot let off fireworks. It's only going to add to that. So a centralised reporting mechanism will help. The other issue that we've rightly raised throughout the debate today is the issue of illegal fireworks entering Scotland and people who will buy them from elsewhere. Whether that's coming from other parts of the UK, Europe or even elsewhere, what will, what will be done to prevent that if that were to occur? And finally, is cooperation with retailers about their continued supply of fireworks. Because what, what we do know is that if this bill passes, it will immediately close down a number of businesses overnight. And we have to be quite honest with ourselves about that. Um, and those dedicated to the sale of fireworks, uh, of which it may only be up to about a dozen, but still you're putting businesses uh, out of business overnight. That has to give some consideration to that. But the other retailers who will continue to exist and survive uh, I want to know if they will continue to sell fireworks, at what times of year, what happens to stockpiling, and so on and so forth. All of that, I think, in the round will uh, point towards uh, improving fireworks safety. All of these measures have, have the buy-in of, of the industry, of retailers, and I'm sure of, of those who are blighted and affected by the misuse of fireworks. And uh, I'm simply asking uh, the government to consult on that, draft a plan, and have regards to any responses, publish it, and come to Parliament with it. It's not holding the rest of the bill back, it's not wrecking the rest of the bill, but I think it's an important addition to the bill, because if it's really about fireworks safety, then let's put it on the bill, and let's put that onus on ministers of this government and future governments to make sure that they are on top of this. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call the Minister. So I do share Mr Green's views on the importance of fireworks safety and as was debated during stage two when Mr Green lodged a similar amendment, much of what is included in the amendment reflects what was proposed by the British Fireworks Association's 10-point plan. And I've said on a number of occasions I welcome much of the plan and the good progress being made in a number of areas highlighted within it. Mr Green stated in his remarks during stage two that he didn't want this work to be left to policy in future governments, preferring to have it committed into law within this bill. However, I believe I've already made very clear through my actions my strong commitment to firework safety, so I don't believe it's necessary or appropriate to use this bill to write into legislation what are already stated policy commitments and commitments that have followed on from the already published fireworks action plan from 2019. Thank you. Jamie Green, to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 85. I'm going to accept at face value, and it's on the record, it's a matter for the official report, that the Minister is, 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 uh, is, uh, has lots of positive things to say about the, the industry's 10-point plan, and herself has personally committed to maintaining a watchful eye. But like the review of the entire Act, which is sadly just a one-off piece of work in our endeavours to, to make that a continuous piece of work, uh, um, it didn't succeed. It, that's all well and good now, but if we're creating law, we're creating law for decades or indeed hundreds of years. We don't know what future governments will look like. We don't know what their priorities will be. We don't know what their interests will be with regards to the fireworks industry or indeed fireworks at all. It is for that reason that it's better to be on the face of the, face of the bill. It's future-proofing it. It's sensible. It's what people want to see. This is, after all, a bill that's meant to improve firework safety. The only reason I can think of that the Minister doesn't want is that it simply adds uh, to their ministerial workload. And that's not a reason, not that, I will in a second, but that's not a reason 
to vote it down. That's not a reason to say we can't do this, because everything that I've just said when I move the amendment is achievable and doable and reasonable. I give way. Minister. I'd have to disagree with what the member said there in the strongest possible terms. The reason I don't support this amendment is because um, it's repeating work that I've already done. So I published the Fireworks Action Plan in 2019, which details all the non-legislative actions that the government and all of our partners are taking forward year after year after year. So I would encourage the member to read that document. I, I can't wait. Jamie Green. Um, it might, it might repeat work that this minister has done, but it doesn't repeat work which hasn't been done yet. And that's my point. If it's on the face of the bill, it requires the government of the day to perform that piece of work. In five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years, in one second. It, it, it ensures that future ministers may not be as enthusiastic about firework safety as the current one, clearly. And it's for that reason it has to be on the face of the bill. I'm happy to give way. Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you. The, the Minister makes great play of work that has been done in the past, but some of these specific uh, provisions in the amendment uh, relate to issues that might arise, such as the illegal uh, input of fireworks coming into Scotland as a result of the legislation. Therefore, it is uh, obviously something that should be considered. Do you agree? Well, Jamie Green. It is the unintended consequences that we flagged all the way through this process, and I think I have been, uh, been, give, been given a good errand today. It is the unintended consequences of the bill that we do, it's the don't knows. We do not know about the black market. We do not know about the potential for people buying online. We know that the bill can't even regulate that market. We do not know about uh, illegal uh, or, or dangerous fireworks which are mislabeled or come in from, from other markets. It, and it is because of those don't knows that I think the annual fireworks safety plan and all the other measures in my plan are so important to be done on an ongoing basis. So even if they have been done already and all that work is up to date, I want to make sure that the governments in the future continue to do that work. And it is because of the so many unknowns that this is a good way of future proofing the bill. And it is a good way of ensuring that whatever happens as a result of this legislation. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, it is a good way to ensure that whatever happens after this bill. I think we're probably just about out of time, so I will finish there if, if, if Ms McNeill is OK. But I, I would please ask... Oh, OK, if you insist. Holly McNeill. I'm sorry to persist, but just because I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm realising that actually um, some evidence the committee gave is really relevant to what you're saying now, um, and that is the, um, the warnings that were given by the industry where they, where they say that... Um, the fireworks stored in unexpected locations, the, 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 the impact of, of the of loss of trade, which you referred to earlier, whatever you think of that, can certainly lead to a black market, which is more than one thing, and it is one of the unintended consequences. Member says does lead me to the view that it is much more important to actually for the government to give out big safety messages if you subscribe to that view. Jamie Green. Yeah, I don't disagree. And, it, and I think it's because of that unknown of the black market that's been raised so many times throughout this process that we should take cognizance of it. And that's why uh, it's sections B and D in my amendment uh, relate to the government's duty and to, to, you know, to develop and maintain a watching eye over the detection and apprehension of illegal fireworks and those coming uh, into Scotland. And it's for those reasons that I strongly will press uh, this amendment and hope that members will support it. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 85 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 44, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to group 13, increasing penalties for existing firework offences. And I call amendment 86 in the name of Russell Finlay, grouped with amendment 98, Russell Finlay, to move amendment 86 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now for the grand finale, so I warn you all to stand well back. Um, now at stage two, I made numerous attempts to increase the criminal penalties contained within this bill. Put simply, we sought to increase maximum prison sentences from six months to 12 months and fines from £5,000 to £10,000. We lost the argument and will not reheat them here. But what these amendments do, 86 and 90, is look at the sentences contained in two pieces of existing legislation, these being the two most commonly used of the nine pieces of legislation referred to by Jamie Green in Amendment 84. Uh, Amendment 89 relates to the Fireworks Act of 2003, which relates to the supply or use of fireworks. And what the amendment seeks to do is raise the maximum available sentence from six months to 12 months imprisonment while Amendment 90 relates to the Explosives Act of 1875, specifically the throwing of fireworks in public places. Despite how old it is, this Act is actually the most commonly used fireworks legislation today, according to what we heard from the Crown Office. Um, from what it's, for what it is worth, it is worth putting on the record, one of the recurring themes of Stage 1 and Stage 2 has been the difficulty the committee members have had in establishing the number and nature of cases reported to police prosecutions, convictions and how these were disposed of. What was clear was that much of the existing legislation was not being used to its full extent, which we have already heard from Jamie Green, and I will not rehearse that here again. But I do think amendments 89 and 90 are helpful as they take the existing laws and amend them so that it achieves the same thing, which is to give independent sheriffs a wide and reasonable array of sentencing options. The reason these amendments make, some, make, make the maximum prison sentence 12 months is partly due to the Scottish Government's decision in 2009 for a presumption against short sentences of less than 12 months. So, by leaving these two other acts unamended, sheriffs will be very unlikely to pass a prison sentence, even where that might be the preferred disposal. This is a good opportunity to put that right, and I move uh, amendments 89 and 90 in my name. 86 and 90, sorry. Call the Minister. Amendments uh, 86 and 90 aim to increase the maximum penalties available for two firework related offences, namely those committed under the Fireworks Act of 2003 and the Explosives Act of 1875. And Amendment 86 would increase the maximum sentence available from six to 12 months for those found guilty of an offence under the Fireworks Act when related to the supply or use of fireworks in Scotland. And Amendment 90 relates to the offence of throwing fireworks in public, and that is under the Explosives Act of 1875. But this is a UK-wide offence. So it would make the penalty of up to 12 months imprisonment available for those found guilty of the offence in Scotland. And this would be available as an alternative to the existing penalty of a fine not exceeding level 5 on the standard scale or as an additional penalty. And I think it would create an inconsistency in the penalties available to the courts throughout the UK for what is the same offence. So, presiding officer, consistency, transparency and proportionality across the bill and the law on fireworks is a, of, a, of a whole is important. And the maximum penalties set out in the bill were included following careful consideration of the types of offences in the bill and the levels of penalty applicable for other fireworks. Uh, legislation. I will give way to the member. Russell Fidley. I, I just find it a bit rich that you are talking about consistency with the UK when this entire bill will do the exact opposite. It will create all sorts of potential unforeseen consequences. So it seems to be a selective application of consistency. Well, I do not agree with the member there. The member's amendment is related to existing legislation, and much of the provisions in the bill are, of course, new legislation. So I do not agree with the member on that point. 
Uh, not only do I believe that the maximum penalties that are set out in this bill are proportionate and appropriate, I believe that the levels of penalty applicable within other fireworks legislation are also proportionate and appropriate. And we're not aware of any specific compelling evidence that higher maximum penalties are necessary to deal with the offending behaviour in question. And in fact, during the stage one evidence session, uh, representatives from the fireworks industry highlighted that in their view, uh, maximum sentences are not routinely handed down. Uh, Mr Finlay may point to the lack of a custodial sentence option. I may be preempting uh, the member's intervention there under the Explosives Act. However, the offences under this Act are applicable throughout all the jurisdictions in the UK. And if a penalty of imprisonment was to be made available in Scotland only, this would make the penalties across the UK very inconsistent. The member wish to give way? I mean, I'll give way if the member wishes to come back in. Uh, no, Finley. I think you've covered the point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Minister. Um, so there's already sufficient custodial sentences available under the common law for a more serious uh, incidents, and we did discuss this at length at stage two, uh, and those that are likely to attract a sentence of imprisonment. And so that would be offences like culpable and reckless conduct, uh, breach of the peace, or common law assault. And these carry custodial sentences of up to and over 12 months imprisonment. So I don't believe that the current penalty under the Explosives Act should not be changed for Scotland only. Uh, therefore, presiding officer, I cannot support this amendment. Thank you. And Russell Finlay to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 86. Thank you. As I as stated in my intervention, the government's concern about um, possible inconsistencies seems to be at odds with the entirety of the bill, which is going to do just that, with all sorts of potential unforeseen consequences. But this is an important amendment. Both, both of these are important amendments. It gives the independent judiciary scope to sentence as in how they see fit. We are not um, imposing sentencing. We are just giving people, giving the judges and the courts that option. And one thing I would return to in respect of the Minister's response is uh, the firework industry and others scrabbled about, frankly, trying to get data on how uh, sentencing has been applied in the disposals. And it was hard to come by, short of raking through Google and local newspapers and so on, because, as the committee experienced, the sort of scarcity of data that has been a hallmark of this whole process, frankly. So uh, I would like to move amendment in my name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The boat is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 86 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 43, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 90 in the name of Russell Finlay. 
Already debated with Amendment 86. Russell Finlay to move or not move? No, not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 87 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with Amendment 78. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 88 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with Amendment 78. I remind members that, that if Amendment 88 is agreed to, I can't call Amendment 89 due to a preemption. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 88 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 43, no 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 89 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 78. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 48 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 8. Russell Finlay to move or not move? It moved. The question is that amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I can confirm we are all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call amendment 49 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with amendment 2. Katie Clark to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. In the interests of time, may I ask Ms Clark if it is her intention not to move amendments 49 to 67? That is correct. Thank you. Katie Clark has indicated... <laughs> Katie Clark has indicated that she will not be moving amendments 49 to 67. It would be helpful if any member who wishes to move any of the amendments from 49 to 67 could indicate now. No member has indicated that they wish to do so. I therefore intend to read out the amendment numbers and confirm that they are not moved. I will do so at a pace that would allow any member to call out at the relevant point that they wish to move the amendment. So. I confirm for the record that the following amendments in the name of Katie Clark are not moved. Amendments 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66 and 67. 
that ends consideration of amendments. At this point, as members will be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the Bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this Bill, in my view, no provision of the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic, Art Pyrotechnic Article Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. Thank you. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Extremely happily to move, <laughs> President Officer. Thank you. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. There are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. And that concludes decision time and I close this meeting.